All right, so let's start off with Venetian Ceruse. It's easy to recognize even if the name isn't. It's that thick white lead powder biddies used to whack on their face, cement thick. Something they've been doing since ancient Roman times. Queen Elizabeth I was known for her iconic white makeup. The Venetian Ceruse made up of white, lead, and vinegar and applied to achieve a pale, smooth complexion that signified wealth. The beauty ideals at the time included bright, wide set eyes, snow white skin, rosy cheeks and lips, and fair hair. Elizabeth Elizabeth I was known to use ceruse to hide her smallpox scars, and ceruse became so commonly used by many fashionable aristocratic women during the era. Yet the toxic effects of lead absorbed into the skin didn't go unnoticed in that time either. And it's hard to when your skin becomes grayish and shriveled, and your face hair falls out, and your teeth start eroding away. Not subtle. So because the makeup ate at the skin, the skin needed to be hidden more with more makeup. In addition to ceruse, the beauty regime also included a face wash with eggshells, alum, mercury and honey. The mercury also eating away at the skin and the eggshells causing micro abrasions to make that all the easier. In the 1700s, a famous beauty and aristocrat from Ireland died from lead poisoning due to her use of ceruse or what was called death by vanity, Maria Coventry, Countess of Coventry. Its name is beautiful and has the same cloying sweetness and smell as its poison, Belladonna, aka Dudley Nightshade. This is the patron flower of one of my closest friends, so girl, this is for you, according to the big bad book of botany. The World's Most Fascinating Flora by Michael Largo. A trop of Belladonna's poisonous extracts were historically used by assassins to kill their targets and by women to dilate their pupils to look more seductive. The roots are the most potent part of the plant, but even one leaf can be fatal when ingested or exposed to. Yet Italian women who called it Belladonna used deadly nightshade as an eye drop to dilate their pupils, which supposedly made them more attractive, or at least made them look like an anime character. Naturally, some poison in your eyeball can cause visual distortion and and sensitivity to light, and if taken systematically, can kill you pretty quickly. In the mood for a snack, how about some toxic dust pressurized into a cracker? Our snake wafers. It's exactly what they were too, so if you didn't pop into your mouth whole, that thing would have the crumbling power of a Nature Valley granola bar. Sold under the brand name Dr. James P. Campbell Safe Arsenic Wafers, the fact you put the word safe in there, you know, dicey. In the United States and Europe, these were little white chalk wafers that could treat a variety of complexion problems, such as skin tags, mold, freckles, pimples, blemishes, and also advertised to cause pale skin which was oh so classy. In fact, the consumptive chic aka dying from deadly disease chic became an ideal beauty standard during the Victorian era as victims of tuberculosis would become sickly pale and thin. Rich people saw that on the street and said, oh, I think I might steal that look. However, the way that arsenic worked was by destroying red blood cells and thanks to the toxicity of arsenic, it could also cause symptoms like damage to the kidneys and nervous system, hair loss, and skin lesions called arsenic keratosis. The wafers were marketed as being safe naturally, and while tolerance to arsenic can be built up in small amounts, arsenic is one of the most toxic substances with a median le lethal dose of 13 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. To build an immunity would take scientific precision, not snacking on poison crackers you fish out of your purse. Does the sentence dysfunctional hair removing cream raise alarms in you? Because it does in me, and apparently, the FDA, it's Kremlu. Advertised as perfectly safe and somehow permanent way to remove hair, this cream actually poisoned the user instead, like everything else on this list. And while women mostly applied it to the upper lip, the problem showed up literally everywhere on the body, according to historian Gwen Clay. Now, women lost their hair all over their bodies, as well as suffering paralysis and even damage to their eyes, she written. So, one of Kremlu's active ingredients was thallium acetate. Thallium was also used as rat poison and has since been banned in the US due to how toxic it is to even people and animals exposed accidentally. Kremlu didn't stay on the market, but it was no thanks to the FDA. The Journal of American Medical Association, which in 1932 described the product as a viciously dangerous depilatory, led to the diagnostic fight against Kremlu by publishing a series of articles about its effects. Women who suffered side effects of the popular product sued the company, forcing it into bankruptcy in 1932 after winning more than 2.5 million in damages. But the FDA went consulted could only 
refer to the JAMA's work and Karamlu didn't qualify as a drug and the agency didn't have power to regulate cosmetics yet at the time. Nothing like a beautifier that makes you into a terrifier. Gurad's Oriental Cream. Bonus points for that dicey name. All right, so it's the 1920s and there's a popular beauty cream called Rad's. And it's been on the market for decades, regardless of the horror stories, you'd hear endlessly about it from all your girls. It constantly caused mercury poisoning from the calomel compound in it, which was no picnic to go through. Then, party on, you would develop dark rings around your eyes and neck, get bluish black gums that were jiggly like jelly, and lose teeth before dying from organ failure. The women could wear the cream once or twice without ill effects. Over time, that definitely changed. But as mentioned, it was one of the products that just stayed on the shelves. The cream was available for decades, but the FDA started to regulate cosmetics in 1938 thanks to the Roosevelt's at the House of Horrors event. Calomel was no longer allowed, which means I'll never experience a magic of a mercury-filled makeup or figure out what the color Rachel cream was supposed to be for this brand. In fifth place, we have a dimple machine. In the 1930s, dimples were considered to be one of the most beautiful accessories any gal could have, leading to Isabel Gilbert inventing the dimple machine in 1936, which promised to give you dimples. This contraption, also referred to as the dimpler, consisted of a chin strap that held two soft rubber dimple indenters in place, one on each cheek. The strap had a coil that created pressure and was described as very uncomfortable and uh, the dimples left your face within a few hours anyways. Jeepers, I guess a lot of folks really wanted to look like Shirley Temple, which is fair. She was pretty adorable. I feel like nowadays, thanks to the interwebs, we have a lot more folks that we can decide that we want to look like. Personally, I'm a mix of wanting to look like my celebrity crush and a Bratz doll, or a Barbie, depending on the day. In fourth place, we have Hair Secrets. Alrighty, Let's spin the wheel to see where we're starting with this one. Ah, Greece. Alrighty, to achieve blonde hair, which was highly coveted, women would drench their hair in vinegar to bleach it, which would lead to, you know, hair loss and thus the popularity of wigs. Something I didn't know before today was that in ancient Egypt, only women from higher classes were allowed to have long hair, and slave women had to cut their hair very short, and the hair cut off was often used for making headpieces for the aristocrats. Before hairspray was invented, women used to use lard to keep their huge wigs in place. There were many times when rats jumped on women's wigs from the smell of the lard. Okay, that's a big no for me. Sure, I attract the occasional flies with the amount of hairspray that I wear when I curl my hair, but that's plenty. Modern sidebar. During the World War II days, women had to make do without wax and used sandpaper to remove unwanted body hair. Yeah, I'm shuddering. In third place, we have Roman makeup. So the Romans attributed great power to cosmetics. Cosmetics first used in ancient Rome for ritual purposes were just part of daily life. Some fashionable cosmetics, such as those imported from Germany, Gaul, and China, were so expensive that the Lex Opia tried to limit their use in around 189 BCE. These designer brands spawned cheap knockoffs that were sold to poorer women. Working class women could afford the cheaper varieties, but may not have had the time to apply the makeup, as the use of makeup was a time consuming affair because cosmetics needed to be reapplied several times a day due to weather conditions and poor composition. Cosmetics were applied in private, usually in a small room where men did not enter. Cosmete, female slaves that adorned their mistresses, were especially praised for their skills. They would beautify their mistresses with the cultus, the Latin word encompassing makeup, perfume, and jewelry. Scent was also also an important factor of beauty. Women who smelled good were presumed to be healthy. Due to the stench of many of the ingredients used in cosmetics at the time, women often drenched themselves in copious amounts of perfume. Romans believed that the smoke from the burning ambergris would make women more attractive. Ergo, ambergris was typically used in face powders for this reason. Another trick involved sitting over straw fires to make hair shine, or sleeping in a vase filled with red chicken fluid to make it thicker. If that wasn't gross enough, urine was included in facial masks that women used to look clean and beautiful. They also used urine to whiten their teeth as well. Mm. Hard pass. In second place, we have the uses of baths. Nowadays, I know I personally love a good bath to relax, you know, aching muscles or just decompress, but history wasn't always that way. Vapor baths have been described as similar to a modern day sauna with unknown vapors that claim to cure all kinds of ailments. Sadly, the Victorian era bath ended up burning more people than actually curing them. Next up, we have the crocodile feces bath. The Greeks and Romans apparently found the best way to fight wrinkles and lines was by collecting the feces of the crocodile and having a bath in it. A Apparently it reduced aging to quite an extent. I'll uh, stick with my Epsom salts and uh, Lush bath bombs. Thanks. In first place, we have methods of obtaining pale skin. I'm very grateful that my Snow White complexion is quite natural, thanks to my German Irish mutt heritage. But for those who wanted it, here are some ways not to do it. Going back to using olive oil for everything, apparently if you combine it with white lead, it can be used to lighten the skin tone. Although this made people's faces visibly lighter, the women who did this were also subjected to death by slow lead poisoning, which was, you know, absorbed into their skin. 
lead used to be used for a lot of makeup, and while it was efficient, it was also pretty dang deadly. Speaking of deadly, around the 6th century, an aristocratic woman, in a haste to develop that pale, death-like pallor, which was very famous in those times, used to drain their bodies of all their red fluid, one drop at a time. Well then, that explains why everyone was so weak and tired all the time. But geez, don't waste that elixir, make sure you're donating it to your friendly neighborhood vampires. A common way to remove freckles and tans, and achieve that flawless pale complexion, was by using lemon juice mixed with sugar and borax on the face in the 1890s. And once again, for that eternal facial glow and skin bleaching, more modern women would wear a face mask taped to their faces while they slept. I would never be able to sleep if I tried that. In less lethal practices, those geisha women I mentioned before used rice flour powder based paste as a foundation. Hey, now that's something I feel like I could try and not risk my health with. So now let's start off at number 10, short teeth. Ooh, this one hurts right off the bat. The renaissance period saw a a, a trend, a fun trend, that makes me cringe. I just start off with it and then I'll recover and we'll move on. Women during this era were categorized by features like wide hips, a narrow waist, long legs, all the craziest restrictive clothing you can imagine, they had it. However, there were also peculiar notions of beauty that emerged from this time. Short teeth, yeah, little teeth, file them down. It was believed that the smaller the teeth in length, the more attractive they were considered. As a result, individuals would go to extreme length to achieve this desired look. Again, back in this era, Era. It wasn't done in the best, most ideal way, I guess you could say. Teeth were sometimes filed down to reduce their size, aiming to create the impression of dainty and delicate teeth. Delicate now that you shaved off all the enamel. Number nine, medieval tights. I'm actually wearing a pair right now. You just can't see. Haha. -ha. During the Middle Ages, men would wear tights. Now, this was associated with practicality and functionality rather than fashion. Although, I'm sure some of these noble lords absolutely cooked wearing these tights, you know? Look like Link from Zelda. They're great out there. I'm sure some of these guys invented fashion. That's all I'm saying. Sir Lulu of House Lemons. I'm like, oh, these are great. <laughs> Tights were an essential garment for both men and women alike. They provided warmth, protection, and ease of movement, of course, particularly for those engaged in physical activities such as horseback riding and combat or doing top 10 lists for YouTube. It's also a pretty good one. Tights were typically made from wool or linen and they covered the legs from the waist to the feet. Of course, they were worn underneath other garments like tunics and doublets. And as the Middle Ages progressed, tights began to be made from silk and more decorative elements were soon added, reflecting a blend of practicality, but now for sure fashion. Now we definitely have a lick of fashion in those Spanx. They also reserved a symbol of status and wealth, as of course only the affluent could afford such a fancy pair of tights. Yeah, imagine that, tights are fancy. Number eight. Ancient Greek unibrow. I love this one. This is so good. I might bring this back. Ancient Greek dudes, I'll start by saying they did not around. You're pretty fit, pretty jacked. Wouldn't want to fight any of them at any time. That being said, this one's kind of funny. In ancient Greek culture, a unibrow was considered a desirable trait and was connected with beauty and intelligence. The unibrow was believed to be a sign of strong character and an indication of a person's high intellectual and moral qualities. It was even imitated by those who did not naturally have a unibrow. How fun, they would just lie to you, that's great. The ancient Greeks valued symmetry and harmony in physical appearance, and the unibrow was considered to enhance the balance and attractiveness of your face. Damn, maybe I should stop shaving my unibrow right there. Time for my intellectual properties to rise up. Number seven, you're so vain. During the 17th century in Great Britain, the wealthy and aristocratic, they embraced an extreme trend of pale skin. A lot of pale dudes. They also adopted plunging necklines to partially expose their um, chest area as a fashionable statement. Victorian cleavage, what an invention, we love that. The combination of a pale complexion and exposed clothing symbolized affluence and the ability to avoid sun exposure. Unlike peasants, you know, who actually see the sun day in, day out. God forbid you caught a UV ray and you were also a royal. Mm, don't like that. Most women achieved this paleness by using an artificial powder, and then it got a little more specific. Then women began drawing blue veins on their, um, you know, all down their stuff here. Literally, they would take blue paint and just draw these very faint paint lines. Just faint streaks of blue. Now it's interesting to see where we're at now with beauty trends and paint and stuff. Today it's way more complicated than a few veins running down your neck. Today we have the show Sexy Beasts. That's a lot of work up here up top. That's a lot of blue paint, that's all I'm saying. Number six, elongated skulls. Turning the clocks way back for this one, the practice of elongating skulls among the Maya civilization is a fascinating cultural phenomenon. Now, I wouldn't call this a beauty trend by any means, not at all, but I had to include it in this list because well, when else can I talk about it? The practice held significant cultural and societal significance for the Mayan people, representing social status, beauty ideals, or even spiritual beliefs. That's our best guess. I mean, 
That's our best guess. Today we really don't know. It was so long ago. Elongated skulls were achieved through the application of binding techniques such as tightly wrapping cloth or using wooden boards to shape the skull during growth and development stages. While the precise reasons for this practice still remain a speculation, it reflects the rich cultural diversity and unique practices of ancient Maya civilizations. And then we got to unibrows. You know what I mean? Where have we gone? Number five, fake beards. I can't grow a beard, so maybe I'll just start rocking the, the fake one. You know, like Hatshepsut. Long before Cleopatra, Hatshepsut Put was the first woman to obtain power as a pharaoh. She was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. There were just a few that were women in total, but during her reign back in the mid 1400s BC, following the death of Thutmose II, she was determined on being portrayed as a male. The pharaoh, fake beard, the massive muscles, historians believe that this was all done as an act of politics. After her passing, come 1458 BC, her stepson took the throne, Thutmose III, and he destroyed everything in her name and image. Well, mostly everything. Now we have this beard did Pharaoh that we're pretty sure we figured out. Number four, acne. Ancient Egyptians came up with a, an interesting method on getting rid of those pimples, that's for sure. Remind you, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing, so again, creative. Physicians back then discussed pimples as these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin from four to five years. And by squeezing these spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were called maggots back then. Imagine your partner, hey, can you get this pimple on my back? Yeah, I think I got some maggots in there. I don't know. I'd be sick. See ya. Now we're single. They would refer to severe cases of acne as maggots that lie in a bed of roses. Hey, if a physician ever told me I had maggots that lie in a bed of roses on my persons, I would faint. That's the scariest news I've ever heard in my life. That's some bad news, man. Dermatological disorders were thought to be human skin taken on the properties of animals. Yeah, oh, you have acne? Hmm, are you sure you're not turning into a bird? Maybe it's that, come back next week. Ancient Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds, all to get rid of acne, hopefully. Sorry, maggots, not acne, maggots. All to get rid of maggots. I'm gonna go throw up. Number three, prosthetics. The ancient Egyptians were a culture of firsts and some of their achievements we still have no idea how they were able to accomplish. Like the pyramids? I couldn't tell you. Could you? Didn't think so. Hit that thumbs up. We're both wrong. We're both learning. It's very likely that some of the first ever prosthetics were used in ancient Egypt. How fascinating. Imagine being the first guy to make a toe, a fake toe. A female mummy who was discovered near Luxor had her death dated somewhere between 950 and 710 BCE. And she was also found with a prosthetic toe made from wood and leather on her person. While this of course is a wonderful cosmetic replacement and it's no secret that the ancient Egyptians certainly valued aesthetics, it seems as though this prosthetic toe was completely functional and was actually used to help this woman walk. The toe, after it was discovered, had significant signs of wear and tear, which then inspired experts to start a study, look a little further, and they did. So they took participants and tested their gait, both with and without the use of a replicated toe, and in ancient Egypt, the common footwear were sandals, and walking in them would have been uh, next to impossible without a big toe. So it's clear that this prosthetic was very helpful and important to those similar to this Luxor mummy. Not exactly a beauty practice, but I'm sure they also felt a little more confident with that toe. This is also too impressive to exclude. Beauty list. I'm like, yeah, toes are beautiful. Why not? Throw them on. Number two, henna. I got henna done a few years ago and I totally blanked. I forgot that it lasted longer than like two days. I was like, day four, I'm like, what's going on, man? Is this permanent? While on one hand, pun intended, it is beautiful, ancient Egyptians' use of henna went beyond style and beyond imaging oneself after the gods. See, henna also has cooling effects on the body and ancient Egypt was, uh, was quite hot. It was used by ancient Egyptians to color their hair and fingernails and shades of red and orange. Now this shade, this exact shade, also provided comfort on hot days. Come back with some henna, that's kinda nice. It lasts longer than a few days though, just so you know, if you wanna get henna, it's important to know. That guy did not tell me in Greece. No, he did not. And finally, number one, deodorant. When it comes to deodorant, today we listen to the Old Spice guy. He's always whistling about something new. But long before he was born, ancient Egyptians used ostrich eggs for deodorant. They made perfumes and oils, this is commonly known, but they were also the first to use any type of a deodorant. Deodorant, like underarm deodorant. It was so impressive. Ostrich eggs mixed with a little fat and tamarisk and tortoise shell and then nuts. Mix them all together and bam, there you go. You're ready for date night. Just apply all of that on your body. Another method was a little more yummy than ostrich eggs and nuts. See, Egyptians would also use porridge balls. How creative is that? Flavored porridge rolled up and safely tucked in in your underarm right there, right there on your little smelly chicken wing. This morning I had some deodorant just crumble apart when I was applying it. You ever have that happen? Turns to feta cheese cheese all of a sudden, mid-application. Now my bathroom sink looks like a Greek salad. It smells great, but not practical. Might have to go back to the porridge ball method. Who knows? Maybe I have one right now. Maybe that's why I haven't moved this arm the whole time. Who knows? Kicking off our list at number 10. 
Seam squirrels. I love squirrels. Being Canadian, we see quite a bit of them. They're a little too friendly for me at times, but they're great. During the Old West era, seam squirrels were, well, not what you think. Personal hygiene was not a priority for many people back then, obviously. And lice infestations were, unfortunately, quite common. Now, the type of lice that affected people during this time was commonly known as body lice, which is pretty horrible. That could be found in the seams of clothing, hence the term seam squirrels. Yeah, not actually a squirrel at all. It's just body lice. Gotcha. Body lice, of course, was a major problem during the Old West era, and they were responsible for the spread of diseases like typhus, trench fever, and relapsing fever. Relapsing fever? I haven't even heard of that one. That's terrible. These diseases were often fatal because, you know, ye Old West, and many people in the Old West succumbed to them. To combat the spread of lice and the, you know, one of many diseases that they carried, people in the Old West often resorted to extreme measures, such as burning their clothing or even shaving their heads completely. That's why you see old cowboys and they look like they're stressed, they have no hair, their clothes are just gone. You're like, what happened? Lice, lice happened. Some people also used remedies like vinegar and kerosene to try and kill the lice, so yeah, it was a rough time either way. Overall, lice infestations were a significant health concern during the Old West era, and they played a significant role in the spread of disease. Yeah, it wasn't just rats in the medieval era, it was also lice which is even grosser, in my opinion. Number nine, Old West Dental. I could use some Old West Dental recently. I got a, I'm chewing on one side right now, you know what I mean? In the Old West, dental hygiene was not a priority for everyone, they couldn't afford it. And also, dental care was often very sparse. You couldn't really find it anywhere, for that matter. People generally didn't have access to modern dental tools or products, and many did not have regular access to any dentists at any point in their life, which is a sad but real fact. That would suck, I'm terrified. However, there were some basic dental hygiene practices that people in the Old West may have followed to keep their teeth, you know, somewhat in their heads, you know, keep their gums not rotten. Didn't do much, but did something. There were toothbrushes. Not many, but you know, wasn't as good as Oral-B. There's some stuff. More often than not, you'd have to use twigs or chew on mint, that kind of natural survivor stuff. Some people may have also used a cloth or a rag to rub their teeth clean. Yeah, don't forget your tooth cloth before you go on vacation, I guess. You gotta and put it back in your pocket. Your old woody teeth, gotta rub those. Access to professional dental care was limited in the Old West. Some towns, some, had dentists, but all they did back then was just pull out the problem. They didn't give you a crown. They're like, which one hurts? All right, get out of here. All without anesthesia. So that's a great time. You're gonna remember all of it. Other options included a community toothbrush, which is hilarious to think about and also so sad. Yeah, some public establishments had a public toothbrush. Can you imagine? Go out, have a little brush, check your teeth. All right, cool. I'm gonna go back to the bar. I'm gonna be sick. I'm gonna actually throw up right now. Number eight, no spitting. Spitting was a common habit back in the Old West. You see it in movies and parodies. They're always spitting on the ground and stuff. Well, it's because it's real. It's a real fact right there. It wasn't a officially outlawed. However, many towns and cities did prohibit spitting on sidewalks and inside of public buildings because yeah, please don't do that. Thank you so much, sir. This was largely due to concerns about hygiene and of course, like I said earlier, the spread of disease. In addition, spitting was considered rude and uncivilized behavior. Yeah, of course, and many people were offended by it. Middle of conversation, guy just spits in between your feet. I'm like, wait, don't do that. Please don't do that ever again. Some businesses even had signs asking customers to not spit on the floor. Can you imagine what kind of hole you're in? You have to ask people not to do that. There was also social norms in place that discouraged spitting in certain situations. For example, it was considered impolite to spit in the presence of a woman or in formal settings, which, yeah, I agree, still do that today. That's great. Despite these efforts to discourage spitting, it remained a common practice among cowboys, miners, and other workers in ye old West. They're like, yeah, I have shit in my mouth. I don't know, we don't have water. I'm gonna spit, sorry. Number seven, communal towels. Ugh, oh, this one's so rough. It's exactly what you think it is. It was a ride. Today, we have paper towels that you pump like 13 times just to get a little sheet, or sometimes, if you're lucky, that Dyson air drying thing where you just dip your hands in for like 13 seconds and then it's done. You're like, oh, the future is here. That's always fun, that one. Back in the Old West, communal towels were often used in public restrooms and other shared spaces. Yeah, just one towel for all. Just to dap off everything that's wet or damp back then, ew. These towels were usually made of cloth and hung on a rack for multiple people to use just in public, like it's your bathroom. While this may seem unhygienic by our modern standards now, it was a common practice at the time, so yeah. I don't know, we can laugh a bit, I guess. People were generally less concerned about the spread of germs and diseases back then, and communal towels were convenient, and they were a cost-effective option for public spaces. However, with the rise of awarenesses about hygiene and germs and all that nasty stuff, the use of these 
towels eventually fell out of favor in the earliest 20th century. Thank God. Imagine dapping off your lips after eating some wings with a communal towel. Some cowboy just, you know, huh, and then he, huh, and then, huh, 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 and then you come in and wipe your, that's so gross. Number six. Hair care? Yeah, I added a question mark there because, I don't know, not much TLC going on on top back then. Throughout history, people have used a variety of natural ingredients for hair care. Nowadays, guys have it too easy. It's like Axe five in one. It's like hair, armpits, legs, feet, all in one. You no way you can do all of that. Popular methods in the Old West were whiskey and castor oil. Yep, all on your big exposed head, right in the sun, there you go. Pantene Pro-V wasn't a thing then, so folks were rubbing their heads clean with castor oil. That's a nightmare. Whiskey was believed to help cleanse the scalp and often promote hair growth, while the castor oil, that option, that was thought to moisturize and condition the hair. So that'd be a fun two-in-one back then. That's great, put that in the stocking. These ingredients were readily available and most importantly, they were affordable, making them popular, but also, realistically, it was their only option. The guys doing whiskey, he's like, yeah, let's clean it up. Clean up top. It's so hot. It's like, ugh, really burns. Number five, Gorad's cream. Gorad's Oriental Cream hit the market back in 1936. This cream was supposed to, you know, freshen up your skin, make you look lighter, younger, tighter, whatever Paul Rudd's doing. But instead, this skin cream had one user ending up in a book that's very, you know, Chamber of Horror styles. Just what not to do in terms of cosmetics and bad stuff. This magic ingredient was meant to magically make you beautiful, and it had some magic mercury inside the product. It was horrible. Not something you want on your face ever. Mercury, no fun. I don't recommend. Zero out of five, my friend. The results were haunting. This woman had soon developed black gums, her teeth loosened, and dark rings appeared around her eyes. It was haunting. It's called mercury poisoning, and it's not fun. Number four, fluoroscope. A proper measurement of the foot is the first step to a healthier lifestyle. If you're off by half a size in either width or length, you're setting yourself up for future problems. So when x-rays started being used to properly measure up family foot sizes in shoe stores, well, it sounded like an ideal start to an otherwise exhausting process. I worked in a shoe store while I was in school, so I get it, you know? The amount of stinky feet I've had to measure up with that metal cold, really cold metal thing? No thank you, gross. So in comes this new fluoroscope technology, right? Measure your feet, but make it cool, make it futuristic, right? Make it technological. This began in the 1920s. Everybody used these things, it was completely normal, and by the time the 40s rolled around, scientists were now concerned about the radiation level emitting off these machines, and eventually they too were banned. They're also really intimidating to look at. There's a speedometer on it, like for some reason. It doesn't look like an easy thing, it's, uh, it looks scary. It looks like a saw trap, you know what I mean? Number three, thallium. In the late 19th century, something called thallium acetate started to sweep the nation. It was a hair removal method, but originally thallium was prescribed for those who suffered with ringworm. Just in case you got both, here you go. So yeah, now we're getting a little concerned historically. Even so, thallium didn't do anything about said ringworm. That in itself was already a failed product. It made patients' hair fall off, so the ringworm was easier to find. Doesn't actually help the issue, just makes it easier to find, I guess. So I guess that's helpful, I don't know, it's still bad. Eventually, thallium was sold by itself as a cream. It's very toxic, it should never touch your skin. This was once rat poison, historically, and then humans were then rubbing it around on their heads casually. And that, that's insane. This was outlawed in the 30s, thankfully, but the fact that this was ever sold in history just baffles me, this whole list baffles me. Number two. Aqua Tofana, I love this one. Going back to the 1600s for this one. If you're a murderino, you know this one already. It's a good one. Aqua Tofana was a cosmetic that was sold to women back in the early 1600s. It was a cosmetic that also doubled down as a poison. Yeah, some naughty stuff going on here. The origins of said deadly cosmetic that was sold and you know, responsible for around 600 deaths is pretty wild. Back in 1632, two women, Francesca Lasarda and Tatiana D'Amato, they both created this poison so that when their husbands kissed them on the cheek, they would then be poisoned from the cream that they put on, right? This was a time where women were treated horribly, right? Like even worse than now, you know what I mean? Like. I was gonna say a time where women had less rights, but I'm like, eh, we're actually getting worse historically, so who knows? But eventually, Tiafana was caught and executed for her crimes, but her recipe, her recipe lived on. Her recipe carried on through her daughter, Yulia Tiafana. She took this deadly recipe to Rome and kept manufacturing it. Pretty badass, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, obviously it's horrible in so many ways, but I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty smart, I think. Like if she was a villain in a Sherlock Holmes movie, we'd love her. 
know what I mean? Inside this cursed cosmetic was arsenic, lead, and belladonna. Colorless, tasteless, and one of the deadliest. And finally, number one, Vita Radium Suppositories. Hey, my favorite one historically, this is great. With guaranteed real radium, there we go, just in case you got that fake stuff, this is the real good stuff. The Home Products Company of Denver, Colorado came out with these suppositories, you know, back in 1930. And the way that they marketed these things is so funny and I have to end the list on it. It's one of my favorites ever. The company reaches out and says, weak discouraged men. If you are showing signs of slowing up in your actions and duties, perhaps if you have begun to lose your charm, your personality, your normal manly attitude, then certainly you want to stage a comeback. The man who has lost these precious attributes of youth knows how to appreciate their value. He realizes that happiness depends on his ability to perform the duties of a real man. Sweet glorious pleasures of life. Nature intended that you should enjoy them. Now is the time to act. And then these real men put radiated suppositories up their real How funny is that? They're like, are you a man? Yeah. Do you want to get back to business? Yeah. All right. Bend over. That's so stupid. This is so dangerous also, obviously, but like, it's so funny that they're so aggressive with this ad. Huh. The initial goal here was to, of course, feel better and, you know, feel like a real manly man again. But instead of waking up feeling refreshed, users eventually stopped waking up altogether. In 10th place, we have how to cure hair loss. So while technically this is a top 10 list, I might be cheating that a little bit today. When I was doing my research, I came across so many different ways throughout history of attempting to cure hair loss that I knew I just had to share them with y'all. So there was no way I was gonna do it myself. Let's start off with, uh... 50 BCE Rome. So Romans who experienced hair loss tended to rum myrrh into their scalps, which sounds simple enough until you learn that other Romans tried a more drastic remedy, which involved burning a donkey's genitals to ash, which was then mixed with the urine of the person losing their hair and applying that mixture to the head. Moving on to Egypt. Donkey hooves, dates, and dog pods would be ground together, mixed with oil, cooked, and rubbed on bald heads as an ancient remedy for hair growth. A medical script known as the Ebers Papyrus offers a different recipe for Egyptian hair loss, mixing fat from a hippopotamus, crocodile, male cat, snake, and ibex, which is then applied to the scalp. If that doesn't work, the follow-up solution is to boil porcupine hair and apply it to the bald areas for four days. Finally, in ancient Greece, if women were going bald, they sometimes used a hair mask consisting of a mix of feces, urine, and menstrual scarletness. Okay. Hippocrates endorsed a mix of pigeon droppings, opium, horseradish, beetroot, and spices as an ancient remedy for hair growth, while Aristotle recommended goat urine as a treatment instead. Um, I'll pass on all fronts, thanks. In ninth place, we have separating lashes with a safety pin. This is probably the most modern trick on today's list, and it comes courtesy of film star Audrey Hepburn. She liked to darken, plump, and lengthen her lashes like the best of them, and she had one trick to ensure that her lashes looked naturally fanned out and clump free, and it wasn't, you know, some sort of magic mascara wand. After applying a layer of mascara, her makeup artist, Alberto De Rossi, would take a pin and meticulously separate every single lash. Just for a fun little reference, the upper eyelid alone has an average of roughly 70 to 150 lashes, making that undertaking quite the long and possibly, you know, dangerous process. To prepare for the undertaking, it's recommended to curl your lashes first to make things easier. One must start at the base near the waterline and pull the pin through to the top, separating, yep, each individual lash. So this defines each lash as well as helps to distribute the dark mascara pigment more evenly. Once you complete the first eye, repeat on the next and then proceed to your lower lid lashes if, you know, if you'd like. I'll stick with an overall like lash brush thanks and like my reliable false lashes. That's good enough for me. As much as it hurts to yank out the occasional lash from lash glue or liquid latex, at least I'm not risking, you know, stabbing my eye. Trust me, I'm a heck of a klutz. In eighth place, we have geisha beauty. So during the Heian era, geishas would blacken their teeth using a mixture of oxidized iron fillings steeped in an acidic solution. One of the main reasons for this practice was the fact that for hundreds of years, pitch black objects were regarded as immensely pretty. And unlike the Western ideals that folks like myself have been raised with, that's just how things were there. The women used to remove their heavy makeup with a nightingale poop, which apparently did wonders for their skin. The active chemical in the bird poop is guanine, which allegedly cleanses the skin and rejuvenates it. Now, geishas aside, Back in the day, the beauty of Japanese women was often judged on the basis of their hair length, and the ideal length was considered two feet below their waist. I don't want to think about how long it would take to brush hair that long, never mind the hairballs that would form. Or mats. 
Nah. In seventh place, we have the use of copper. So copper apparently has many benefits for the skin, one of which is that it can help to heal wounds and scars, along with having anti-aging properties. Ancient Egyptians used a lot of copper for their skin. And according to modern dermatologists, copper peptides are well known in the skincare world. So apparently I've been hiding under some sort of rock. They improve skin, including firmness, smoothness and reduction of fine lines and wrinkles by promoting collagen, elastin, and improved antioxidant activity. Just a little note though, too much copper intake can make you nauseous and give you gastrointestinal issues or, you know, cause serious organ system toxicity. Good news, I'm not gonna freak out my gold-loving dad today by replacing silver with copper as my favorite metal. Honest to goodness, even just choosing to have fake silver ornaments on my Christmas tree over gold last year almost started a full-blown argument in Canadian Tire. It was a whole thing. In sixth place, we have Egyptian makeup. Look. Everyone knows about ancient Egyptian using coal around their eyes to shield against the sun, deter flies, and overall just look stunning. Personally, I very much still appreciate the practice, along with my collection of eyeliner pens. I currently have like four black ones on the go for reasons. If you don't believe me, here are the two I have on me that I used to touch up this makeup with before I started talking to that. But what you might not have known was that crocodile dung mixed with donkey's milk was used by Cleopatra as a face mask. She also famously bathed in milk with rose petals for hours, which like, honestly, goals. Cheeks were blushed up using a mixture of clay and crushed beetles, which was something also done later on by Queen Elizabeth I to get her memorable red lips. One of the most popular cosmetic ingredients in ancient Greece was olive oil. According to legend, a Greek cook named Calamus invented soap by mixing olive oil with with wood ash from Mount Sapo, so it could be used for cleaning utensils at sacrifices. However, when he washed his hands with this mixture, his skin became soft and smooth. It was clear that olive oil had cleansing and beautifying properties. So you're telling me that my big fat Greek wedding lied to me about Greeks using Windex for everything? Curse you, Hollywood. Waguro is next. As mentioned in the Heian period, yes again, because they were the hygiene and beauty trend setting period of Japan, Japanese beauty products broke free and created a distinct aesthetic of their own. This included the long straight hair, white powdered face, yada yada, and an unusual beauty ideal, the blackened teeth called ohagaro. Now, it's usually done for the first time during puberty to celebrate maturity and growing beauty for women. Not to mention the charcoals used for are incredibly good for your teeth. During Heian, purely black items were considered pure and beautiful, and people wanted to imitate that as much as possible. What's new about that? Make it the motto for the Kardashian family. Teeth as black as night were seen as beautiful and remained popular as a beauty ideal until the 19th century. Many Westerners who visited Japan described the practice as repugnant because the Japanese custom disfigured the women by making them intentionally unattractive. Naturally, Westerners didn't even see their women as human beings, just walking baby machines, so they couldn't wrap their pea brains around the concept. A woman's appearance is not always about or for them. Many still can't in modern times. However, many Japanese girls were allowed a relatively large decree of both social and sensual liberty. This social ritual is a celebration of the determination of mature women. And while we're on the topic of teeth, how about dental ablation and evulsion? It's hygiene, it's beauty, it's the deliberate taking out of teeth. Three birds, one stone. In Jamon culture in the Japanese archipelago, dating back 13,000 years to 23 years BP, practiced this ritual extensively for ceremonial purposes and during rites of passage. 90% of their population had extracted upper and lower canines and lower incisors, usually when the recipients were between late teens and early 20s. Tooth ablation is explained by the archipelago belief that the body is a physical symbol of membership and social community. It can be shaped by and contributes to its environment. Like how seasons change and tides turn, we evolve. Changes in social environment can affect patterns and choices of body modification. As the mouth is the primary social organ, teeth are one of the most visible parts of the body that can display change and thus be treated through some form of modification, chipping, filling, whatever your choice. In layman's terms, life milestones were commemorated by the extraction of different tooth classes. With a flash of a smile, one would know about the individual's family, if they were an adult or not, if they were married, if they had experienced the death of a loved one or if they had any children. There was no need to ask because your body openly displayed your identity. Pretty cool, right? Since we're on a roll with teeth, let's dive into body modification. A section about Japanese people in the records of the three kingdoms written by Chinese bureaucrat Chen Shao in the late third century describes how the men of Wa, which is the oldest recorded name for Japan, tattooed their faces and painted their bodies in pink and scarlet. The tradition derived from how they decorated their bodies in order to protect themselves from large fish when diving underwater for food. Tattoos were also also present in the indigenous Ainu of Hokadeo and the natives of Okinawa. The women of Ainu, a tribe considered descendants of the Jaman people, bore tattoos around their mouths and the back of their hand. The mustache-shaped tattoo around the lips holds
holding symbolic purposes of warding off evil spirits, and indicating readiness for marriage and assuring a woman's place in the afterlife. On the southernmost Raikou Islands, women had the backs of their hands and fingers tattooed to ward off bad luck and get along with their mothers-in-law. The logic being that any woman who can endure that pain could also endure that of having a mother-in-law that annoying. These indigenous Japanese tattoo cultures were outlawed during the Meiji period, however, making this art form a vanishing tradition. To protect heritage, you can actually get these tattoos for free on Oshima Island. Every culture found its way to reuse and reduce. The tosu is an important aspect of the Zen tradition and counted among the Shichidogaran, the seven indispensable buildings found at every Zen complex. Three of these structures, tosu included, are referred to collectively as the San Mukaduo, aka the Three Silent Halls. See, they can put rules like that in because nobody in that place was eating Taco Bell at 2 a.m., so toilets could be quiet. In earlier times, people in Japan did not consider the toilet to be part of the house. It would always be found in an additional attachment with a specifically designated pair of slippers only meant to be worn while using the toilet. Do not wear them in the house. If you're rich, you had your own. If you're poor, you likely shared with a neighbor. Before the westernization of the country, human waste was tactically used as fertilizers. By emptying number two only cesspits, excrement wouldn't seep into subsoil or flush into rivers that fed our drinking supplies, as was done in the West. And the reason the Westerners were dropping like flies from disease or walking infections whenever they traveled. By properly storing, using, and refreshing it as fertilizer, Japanese also upheld crops the Westerners couldn't. But the people who showered once a year were grossed out by it, so the Japanese folks stopped the cess fertilization. They both mean the same thing. It's beard hygiene. In Japan, there's only one word for facial hair, with the exception to eyebrows, and it's hygiene. Could be sideburns, a mustache, a beard. That's the name for those facial hairs. It also happens that the word self-deprecation in Japanese is also pronounced hygiene. So we can already feel the direction this is going. From the medieval period to the beginning of the Edo period, if you were a samurai, you had facial hair as it was a symbol of power that made them appear intimidating, solemn, and dangerous. Those unable to grow these bushy symbols of manliness were shunned and ridiculed. Like Japan's second unifier, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who had to crazy glue these things on his face every day. Not kidding, Google it. Then, a little into the Edo period, there was a big switch. It was Japan's period of peace, and suddenly, facial hair was viewed as unbridled sign of aggression. So, 17th century law prohibits even those with the lushest of beards from displaying their grandeur, unless you had a facial scar. So, you can either be baby face or you can give yourself a cool ass face scar and grow an epic beard. Huh? What you choosing? When overthrown Western fashion came into Japan and beards and mustaches were popular again. Portraits from this era often have the cartoonishly large ones. It doesn't last long though and clean shaven becomes popular again. So why no beard still today? It's hygiene. Quite literally, yeah, but in a non-literal sense and in our definition of the word. Surveys continue to show Japanese people, particularly women, have the opinion that facial hair is correlated with uncleanliness. Kicking off our list at number 10, ancient Egyptian eyeliner. Whenever you see hieroglyphics or any art depicting the great pharaohs, they're usually rocking some impressive eyeliner. They look great, right? Like a 90s pop star? They look awesome. Ancient Egyptians were the OG eyeliner users. They made their own eyeliner from lead salts. And no, before you think about getting creative, do not try this at home. This wasn't an ideal process. See, for starters, these salts were quite high in lead concentration. So, in order to avoid that mess, ancient Egyptians first had to process and then filter that lead salt for up to 30 days in order to get the lead levels low enough to even be applied. So you had to plan accordingly. You're like, oh, I have a pharaoh date in 30 days? Perfect, we'll start now. It was a hazard if done incorrectly. Not only was this ancient beauty practice, well, beautiful to look at, but Egyptians also needed eyeliner to protect against sun damage, as well as fight off any infections. Yeah, we don't encourage rubbing lead on your eyes today. We have a few different methods on, you know, how to look good. I think. None of them include lead, hopefully, ideally. Number nine, hair gel. Back in my day, in high school, I had to use dippity do Extra Hold Hair Gel. Yeah, I showed a scale on the side. I always got the five out of six hold. That was good. Six was too much. Nobody ever did the full six. That's crazy talk. But in ancient Egypt, we didn't have styling spiking glue and blasting free spray by DJ Polly D. No, we have that today, unfortunately, but back then, a little different. Back then, ancient Egyptians loved styling their hair, but again, before DJ Polly D was born, what is a pharaoh to do? If the Great Pyramids are any indication, they knew something that we didn't. Ancient Egyptians knew how to keep their hair in one place all day long. And that heat too, how do you do it? My curls? I'm jealous. Their hair styling gel was made with shea butter and coconut oil. But more often than not, they would replace coconut oil with almond oil. So this was a completely natural and strengthening styling gel. Cut to today, we have whatever that is. 
ice spray. That's awesome. DJ Polly, psst. No. Number eight, coffee scrub. I love coffee. I don't think I love coffee enough to do a coffee face scrub, but hey, never say never. I'll try anything once. Ancient Egyptians would use coffee scrub to reduce inflammation, improve blood circulation, and since it's a ground up material, it's gonna remove those dead skin cells at the same time. Next holiday season, grab your aunt some coffee scrub. Just tell her how it reduces puffiness, improves the skin's texture, all that good stuff. It'll give you that youthful feral look that you've been going for, you know what I mean? Merry Christmas, here you go, coffee on your face. Using grounded coffee powder to exfoliate your skin sounds like a new idea. It's certainly a hot trend today. But before TikTok, ancient Egyptians already knew these benefits. Damn, I'm gonna get a coffee scrub. Maybe I'll do it, I don't know. After I'm done this cup, I'll just rub it on my face, on my desk, and see what uh, everyone says. Number seven, dead sea salt. You'll never feel more alive than when you use dead sea salt. Here we go. Ancient Egyptians were ahead of the exfoliation game. Dare I say, they invented it. Not only were coffee scrubs a necessity, but salt from the dead sea was one of the most popular popular ancient Egyptian skincare products ever. We traveled far and wide for this one. Salt collected from the Dead Sea was used to exfoliate dead skin cells, and it was so well known at this point that rumor has it, Cleopatra herself would travel all the way to the Dead Sea from Egypt just to take a bath. Yeah, let's be honest, after this point, we'd all love a rejuvenating Dead Sea float. That sounds way better than what I've got at home. Well, bath probably can't even fit in this thing. Dead Sea sounds way better. I once left a house party early to go have a bath. Swear to God, York University. Dipped at like 10 o'clock. I was like, I'm cold, I'm not doing this. 40 minute walk, worth it. Leave your friends for a bath, do it. Number six, wax cones. Head cones, also known as perfume cones, were used in ancient Egypt. You've probably seen them in a thumbnail here at some point. The art depicting head cones is quite unique looking. It's like a pharaoh with a triangle on their head. You're like, what's happening there? What is this? Is this like Illuminati? What is this? Long before Pantene Pro-V, when it came to head cleanliness, these triangular wax cones were here to save the day. And they looked pretty fun to use. I don't know, they would just sit on top of your head. You didn't need to mix anything with lead for 30 days or burn or anything like that. You don't need to put any organs in jars, just a wax cone atop of your head, easy. Back in 2019, experts found archeological evidence that they were in fact used. So yeah, not just a glyph real life history. So I have to bring this up. Men and women alike would wear this cone and your body heat would slowly melt the wax cone down and through your hair. The cone itself was made of oils, fat, resin. It would be placed on their wig or directly onto your head and it would keep melting and refreshing all day long. It's like a little candle almost. A nice little human candle. Nice little Egyptian man candle. As fascinating as ancient Egyptian culture is, I don't think anybody misses wax cones. It's a little easier nowadays. I'm too tall too. I can't have a wax cone. Are you kidding me? It would hit this mic. No way. Number five. Loincloths. Going back to ancient Roman and also ancient Egyptian times, the loincloth was used by all. Either that or you would just be naked. I found this neat step-by-step -step online on how to make your own loincloth, because that's apparently what I do on my free time. Thank you for asking. And it's a bit more complicated than I thought. It's way more, it's way more complicated than just throwing on sweatpants or even, you know, the towel fold like a toga. This had numerous steps. We don't have a lot of archaeological evidence because these linens barely made it through a decade, let alone all this time. But ancient Romans would use leather to make underwear. That's a fun little fact right there. Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the hot sun. We love it. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments, but I'll let Adam tell you about that one another time. That's more of a, that's more of a at home one. Number four, food as medicine. Trying to prevent bad things before they happen, it is a very human skill to have. And when it comes to preventative medicine, the Egyptians had some methods. One more obvious solution is diet. Eating the right stuff truly does help lead to a longer life, but eating the specific right stuff can directly prevent certain issues. As a prime example, the laborers that would build the massive iconic structures we know Egypt for today were kept fed with diets that include a lot of onion, garlic, and radishes. Now, I don't know if the ancient Egyptians knew the chemicals these foods contained, or if they just put two and two together, but onions, garlic, and radishes contain, ad why did I do this to myself, contain allostatin, allicin, and raffinin which are very helpful when it comes to preventing diseases in the super crowded working and living conditions the laborers existed in. That Allison really helps. Another example would be to cure night blindness. In these circumstances, doctors fed their patients powdered liver, which is rich in vitamin A, which is a vital nutrient for vision. Again, I don't know if they knew it contained that specific fang or if they were just like, hmm, I eat liver and I can see better. Discovery. Number three, acne. Ancient Egyptians came up with an interesting method to getting rid of those pimples. Now, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing, and physicians back then discussed pimples as such. Ready for this? They called them these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin for four to five years. 
but by squeezing said spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were referred to as maggots. That's what they thought they were back then. Imagine your partner, hey, can you get this pimple on my back? Yeah, I think I got some maggots, thanks. No, no thank you, that's pretty horrible. That's a horrible reference. They would refer to severe cases of acne as maggots that lie in a bed of roses. I would faint, I would be so sick. If a physician told me I had maggots that lie in a bed of roses anywhere on my body, I would throw up, I'd pass out, I'd be so upset. Dermatological disorders were thought to be human skin taking on the properties of animals. Yeah, you have common acne, hmm, maybe you're turning into a pigeon, who knows? Ancient Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds all to get rid of acne. Yeah, sounds like a horrible alternative. I would much rather just have acne. Maggots? Dude, I'm done with this channel. I'm out of here. That's so gross. Number two, eye makeup. Almost everybody and their mums knows that the Egyptians wore that crazy awesome eye makeup. But what you might not know is that it didn't just serve the purpose of making you look absolutely stunning. No, a lot of these eye makeups were lead based. Now, that sounds pretty bad. I can't lie. It does. And it likely was for some, but it was possible that it boosted nitric oxide by up to 240% in cultured human skin cells. I don't know what cultured human skin cells means, but that's the quote. If you know, let me know down below. What the heck does nitric oxide do? Well, that I do know. It helps to boost up your immune system to fight diseases, which, guess what? That's pretty important, especially in the marshy areas around the Nile, where eye infections are actually pretty darn common. What's cool is that research suggests the Egyptians actually knew that and specifically synthesized the makeup for this purpose. Huh, neat. Finally, number one, mummification. Back in the day, mummification was common, and even today we're finding more mummies. Like, literally last month we just unraveled six more. It's crazy. We're uncovering more ancient history, which is great, but how exactly was this process done? We're talking about back maggots and stuff. What, what did they think about this? How did this even begin a, to be a thing? Well, it wasn't cheap. For starters, being mummified was reserved for the rich. It's a pretty brutal process as well. What you would do is you would put a hook, or well, they would put a hook in your nose after you'd passed away, and then they would pull out your brain and all that just squishy stuff, just out all through this thing right here. And then they would cut the left side of the stomach open, remove all those goods, all the organs, boom, see ya, gone. And while those are drying, you would put your lungs and liver in jars. And then you would put the heart back in the body and then you would wash the insides out with wine and spices all that stuff turpentine turpentines all the time and teens just all in there washing it out then you'd cover the body in salt for 70 days that's a long time but around day 40 you would stuff it with sand now come day 70 finally that's when you wrap them in the mummy bandages then the sarcophagus awaits forever really and then there's just jars of organs also stored in your burial chamber now it's we don't do it it's not as fun anymore we don't put our organs in jars we don't stuff anyone with sand we should, you know what? We should bring I back mummies. Let's just do should. it. I think it's time. Yeah. Kicking off the list at number 10, eyelash extensions. Ugh, right off the hop, here we go. Nowadays, beauty products are safer. They're made in a cleaner way. We're going the right direction when it comes to putting things on or around our eyes. You know, thank God. But back in the late 1800s, we weren't quite there yet. No, not even close. This right here is an ad from the Independent Journal back from 1899. And it says, if your eyes are unattractive, you may make them irresistible by transplanting the hair. Just the hair. Transplanted eyelashes and eyebrows are the latest things in the way of personal adornment. An ordinary fine needle is threaded with a long hair, generally taken from the head of the person to be operated upon. Doink! Oh, let's do a little gray, why not? <laughs> yeah, they would use a white illicit substance that's illegal, that I can't say on YouTube, they would rub that around your eyes just to numb the eyelids. How stupid is that? The doctor would thread, the doctor would then thread your hair through the lids and then cut them down so they're even. Yeah, I thought peeling an eyelash off at the end of the night was bad. I would see that a lot, one of those. This is way worse, never doing this. Number nine, Doramad toothpaste. Doramad, are you mad? That should have been the slogan, are you mad? The worst toothpaste to ever exist. Doramad, yeah, that was the one. Back in the 40s, people were brushing their teeth with radiation. Yeah, even on the actual tube, it says its radioactive ingredients increase the defense of teeth and gums. Mmm. 
I can feel it working already. Oh, I'm gonna throw up. Doctors hate this one trick. Here we go. The tube continues to, well, lie to its users, saying the radioactive cells are loaded with new life energy. The bacteria is then hindered in their destroying effect, leaving behind a pleasant and mild, refreshing taste. Awesome. Yeah, I broke both my front teeth in half when I was younger. If only I had Doramad. I would have just bounced off the pavement and then just kept running. I would have had invincible teeth. Yeah, this toothpaste did not work and it did not stick around. It was horrible for humans. Its radioactivity was low in comparison, but like, its radioactivity was low. I can't even say that. Imagine this coming out now, no way. And just remember, good gums don't bleed, they glow. Doormad. Number eight, radioactive water. Yeah, you thought Dasani water was bad? Okay, just wait, buckle up. Back in 1932, Eben Byers, a 41-year-old steel manufacturer and golf pro, <laughs> hey -o, met his fate in a horrible way. In a constant battle with arm pain and fatigue, Byers was told to drink radioactive water by his physiotherapist. And he was like, okay, you bet. Physiotherapist, anything you say, doctor. He said that drinking this product would help with the golfer's arm pain and fatigue. Magically, okay. Each of these bottles contained one microgram of radium and one microgram of esthorium. Yeah, the guy would drink radiation after every meal and subsequently lost weight, but sadly, he also developed bone necrosis in his jaw. Yeah, Dasani doesn't sound too bad now, does it? Number seven, Thoradia. If somebody told you that your face was glowing back in the late 30s, that would be the highest compliment. Now, it's got a little Edward Cullen vampire vibes. A little different now, but still nice. Thoradia was a beauty product company that made radioactive creams, powders, lipsticks, uh, anything to get your glowy glam on, they made. And they made it in a horrible way. They made thorium and radium lead products to tone facial tissues and remove wrinkles. How insane does that sound coming out of my mouth? Look at cosmetic companies now. Imagine Thoradia just dropping on shelves casually. The product was doing so well that it circulated in Italy, Portugal, Romania, Egypt, Belgium, France, you name it, it was all over the world. It wasn't until 1937 until the French government caught on to these horrible side effects, thank God, and then they pulled it from shelves. Imagine seeing a friend and they're literally glowing, vampire for sure, or radiation. Number six, the trico system. I was talking about plucking my uh, unibrow the other day. I was really going in on that, so. You had to throw this one in. Instead of plucking your eyebrows in the late 1920s, you would ideally want to use the trico system to remove any, you know, unwanted hair. This device was booming back in the 20s. Hair salons had to have this system. And come 1925, there were over 75 trico systems installed in beauty shops all around. And what you would do is you would sit at this large desk, face a small window for a few minutes, and boom, just like that, hair gone. Yeah, just 20 quick visits to your local trico system and then boom, then your hair is magically gone. Just 20 visits, easy. You have the time of the day, right? Their trick here was x-ray technology directly on their face. Not a, not a bright idea. So four years later in 1929, trico system side effects were so well known, you know, being ulcers, carcinoma, keratosis, death. This was not the solution you wanted. So again, pulled from stores. Number five, rationing legs. World War II was a war fought everywhere, and that includes at home. Go ahead and ask your grandparents what it was like. It was only a nickel for a bus ticket, and the movies had newsreels, yes. It's three o'clock and I'm ready for dinner. See, that's what they say. Go ahead and ask them, they'll tell you. Well, okay, Grandma. But on a serious note, people had to ration food for the war effort. They also had to ration other goods that you might not expect, like ladies' nylon stockings. In Britain, nylon stockings were all the rage, but the materials for such were needed for the war effort. So the Gravy Browning Company came up with a bright idea, just paint your stockings on. Some women actually did this and sometimes would even draw on the seam with an eyebrow pencil just to make it look like the real thing. Ooh. However, I just cannot see this being a great idea. I mean, it rains a lot in Britain. Would it not just wash off? What if I get sweaty running for my bus because I'm late for work? Yup, this is another one I'm just gonna have to pass up on. I'm sure the pain was 100% safe for body application as well. It probably wasn't. Number four, bad hair days. All right, this one is generalizing, but hear me out. When was the last time you thought about haircuts in the past? Yeah, see, you don't. That's because they belong in the past. I'm talking about popular hairstyles from the 1950s to 2000s because honestly, there was a lot of them. And honestly, what were we thinking? We are a species that has left our own planet through science and technology. Yet, we come up with hairstyles like the beehive, the mullet, everything in the 1980s. 
and the most heinous, atrocious hairstyle ever, frosted tips. Sorry, Guy Fieri. The list goes on, but my point is people fully went out in public with these crazy hairstyles. I, myself, may or may not have sinned and maybe had frosted tips at one point in my life. I maybe had a button-up shirt with a blue hot rod flames on it. But I'm not, I'm not gonna tell you the complete truth. After being a part of this trend, I can firmly say I no longer want to participate in any more bad hair days or blue flamed shirts. Number three, you do what with my wee? Back to the Romans again, and back to the pee. At least the Incas were keeping it outside the body. I guess, Romans wanted a clean mouth and there wasn't any minty fresh mouthwash to reach for. So, what do you use? We, lots of we, specifically Portuguese we. It was just the most sought after. Now, I'm not a doctor, but I feel like there was more wine drinking than water drinking in Rome, more than people would like to admit it. So, if that is the byproduct of all that wine drinking and you're giving that a swish in your mouth, well, all I can say is I'm just gonna give that a big pass on playing spin the bottle. Number two, my little weight loss friend. Okay, I get it. It makes perfect sense. The numbers add up here. But all I'm gonna say is the chief knows medicine and he said this is a hard pass for me and it ain't it. If you wanna shed that extra winter weight and be beach body ready with minimal effort and still enjoy deep fried chocolate bars, then you have only one thing to do, and that is swallow tapeworms. Where a tapeworm will grow inside your body and help eat those unwanted calories. Trouble is, you can get very sick, and if the tapeworm attaches itself to something that is, well, vital for your living, you're going to have a bad time. You'll get sick. Just don't do this one, please. Don't swallow tapeworms, please. Don't do it. Number one, I spy some great complexion. Arsenic cookies. I'm just gonna be blunt with this one. Women were eating arsenic cookies for their complexion. You could straight up just walk into a Sears in 1902 and just buy some. It says it's safe on the box. For people who aren't familiar with arsenic, it's poison. Spies often carry one in pill form to unalive themselves in case of capture. At this time in history, it was no secret what arsenic was. This is just kind of weird, like putting ketchup on your eggs, kind of weird. That's just a joke. We're having a debate here in the office and I'm just curious to see who does that. But back to the poison. It was not safe and over time, with lots of exposure, you can get very sick. It's arsenic, it's poison. Don't do that one either. Why, that's just wrong. Oh man. Number 10, face off. All right, so it's the 1900s, and technology has gotten good since the 1800s. That means a better life for everyone to enjoy. One such advancement was in women's cosmetics. Introducing the Radia, a brand of makeup that's formulated to make you glow, ladies. And if you don't glow, you can't shine. The secret ingredient, radioactive materials. I honestly can't believe that this one is real, but yep, here I am. Yes, their makeup products contain concentrations of radioactive material to give you the facial boost that you need. Tighten the skin, get rid of wrinkles, and literally make you glow. I'm not a doctor, and you probably aren't one either, but I don't think I have to tell you that applying nuclear material to your face every day before work is not a great idea. In fact, it might be a speed running strategy to see how fast you can end up in a hospital for radioactive sickness. I read a report from the chief, who's a nuclear scientist, and he said that's not it. Number nine, nail biter. There's a short amount of time on the clock. The scores are tied and your favorite team's player steps up to the pitch, plate, or wherever they need to be. Beer sweats begin to drip down your face onto a jersey that should have been thrown out two playoffs ago. The nachos and chicken wings that were once plentiful on your coffee table now lay barren with emptiness. This is what most sports fans would call a nail biter. But all Super Bowl predictions aside, is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about in ye olde times, trimming their nails. How else but with the set of pearl chompers the Lord hath given you. That's just how people did it. Yes, that's right, they bit their nails off. Which even today is kind of gross. You gotta use the old noggin for a minute and think about how clean people's hands were. No running water, no modern toilet paper, Ooh, stinky. That is not a win-win situation. That is, that's actually a lose-lose situation. Don't do that, that's gross. Number eight, mini brows. Back in ye olde times, pale skin was in, and so was dark eyebrows. How to achieve such a complexion? Well, bloodletting for the skin, but I've gone over that before. Something a little more heinous was committed to make ladies' eyebrows look luscious. Mice, a lady's best friend, right? Yeah. 
Besides some French rouge and ivory teeth, a common beauty practice was to have mouse furs as eyebrows. This is just wrong on so many levels. Mice are just gross as it is on a regular basis without them being on your face. But my question is, was there like a mouse hunter or like, was there a mouse farm? Or was the buddy just scooping up mice out of the gutters and skinning them and then, uh, here you go your highness, here's some fresh mice skins. Ooh, yuck man, no. Number seven, pucker up. Hey, on this channel, we've talked about some crazy stuff in history, and a lot of crazy stuff unfortunately had a lot to do with women being hugely mistreated in the past. However, some women acted against this. I'd give specific reasons for wanting to get back to the patriarchy, but I'd be here all day. One woman came up with a devious plan, a way to remove the stinky men from her life and to get away with it too. Introducing Aqua Tofana. It was an odorless, colorless poison that was slow acting and would resemble side effects of a sickness, or at least a common sickness at the time. It was marketed as a cosmetic. Women could wear this on their cheek and when the big hunk of a man came in for a kiss, well, it was probably one of the last things he would ever do. The main ingredients were arsenic and nightshade, which if you didn't know is very poisonous. Next time you forget to take the trash out at night, gentlemen, just take notice of when the wife wants to give you a kiss. It could be your last. Number six, boots with the fur. Most of you probably love a good pair of apple bottom jeans and some boots with the fur. But for our Silver Fox audience, they may remember a pair of denim that was more sinister. Bell bottom jeans. Yes, that's right. These pants were wild to say the least. While its origins may be rooted in the Navy and sailors, their rise to fame was during the 60s and the white powder fueled 70s. Remember disco? I know, right? High platform shoes, bell bottoms, and leisure suits. Although I can't lie, I feel like I look pretty good in a leisure suit. Just saying, I don't know. This is just one of those beauty trends that we thought looked good, but in reality it looked really strange. I'm sure that'll never happen again though. Not like the trends and fads that we had today will ever go out of style. We'll all be looking back and laughing at the silly things we wore, right? <laughs> oh man, I gotta clean up my closet. Are we still gonna be doing Fortnite dances then? I don't know, we'll see. Become skinny by inviting a parasitic man-eating worm into your body? It's the tapeworm diet. And since this is still around today, despite being illegal, I wanna take a moment and say your body is genuinely beautiful and there are thousands of other options before this choice. So the idea is simple and grow. You take a pill containing a tapeworm egg and once attached, the parasite grows inside of the host, ingesting part of whatever the host eats. In theory, this enables the dieter to simultaneously lose weight and eat without worrying about calorie intake. Uh, wrong. Tapeworms take hold in various parts of the body and also grow large in size, resulting in blockage in organs and potentially even death. So it's not like it's just vibing out in your stomach forever unnecessarily. Having started in the 1900s, this trend was the result of the whole 16 inch waist BS that made women break their bodies with corsets. This was an era of beauty equaling sacrifice, and sacrifices were most certainly made once the desired weight was achieved. To get rid of the now unnecessary parasite, dieters would employ the same methods as those unwillingly afflicted by the worms. In Victorian England, this included pills or special devices. One such invention, created by Dr. Myers Shelfield, attempted to lure the tapeworm by inserting a cylinder of food up the digestive tract. It comes as no surprise that many patients choked to death before the tapeworm was ever successfully removed. Some people still attempt this diet. In 2013, Today Magazine reported a woman in Iowa bought a tapeworm online, swallowed it, and then had to go to a doctor for help. This trend wouldn't exist if society could get its crap together, which is is skin bleaching. The issue of colorism and favoritism towards lighter skin has created a decimating global empire today worth more than 8 billion, profiting off of discrimination in today's beauty standards, and predicted to be 12.7 billion on the black market by 2027. This is made painfully obvious by literally every beauty trend we've discussed so far, and that we've covered in every video about beauty. Their goals are to be pale, pale, pale since the time of the Biazetines. In a study published in 2009, it was found lighter skin black applicants reviewed more educated and had better work experience. And then in another famous study in 2011, it found darker skinned black women received harsher prison sentences than lighter skinned black women for the same crimes. So for many people, having lighter skin can mean the difference, how people treat them, see them, respect them. So as a result, we live in a world where beauty standards are often appropriated from people of color, whitewashed, regurgitated, only to be praised and adored then when previously laughed at and bullied. It tells someone that they're not beautiful unless they're pale. So as a result, skin bleaching creams, pills, injections, 
medications and other products come out and they contain hydroquinonines with that work to reduce the amount of melanin in the skin by disrupting the melanin production. This can increase the risk of skin cancer as melanin forms as a function to protect skin and eyes from UV rays. Chemical burns, infections, eczema, herpes, and other conditions also arrive. People have had skin blister off. And then the black market skin bleaches, which is a, the largest industry. Mercury is an active ingredient, which can cause mercury poisoning, leading to damage to skin, liver, kidneys, and the nervous system. So this is a super deadly product. Prepared to be baffled by eyelash extensions. How could they ever be illegal or dangerous? I'm willing to get I'm willing to bet guess that brains jump to glues or maybe the lashes, but banned being made of something poisonous. Wrong and wrong. Be ready to yak, this one's rough. So tales of eyelash extensions in Britain seem to have been spawned by an 1882 news snippet by Henry LaBouche in Truth, which is referred to as the popularity of this procedure amongst Parisian beauties. Here is some of the snippet for you from the Dundee Courier, July 6, 1899, that describes the procedure. Be ready to fast forward if you're the queasy type. So, if your eyes are unattractive, you may make them irresistible by transplanting hair. Sounds all right. There are specialists to make a handsome living out of the process of transplanting hair from the head to the eyebrows or the eyelash. Let me jump ahead to the th through the Shakespeare talk here. Ah, okay. An ordinary fine needle is threaded with a long hair genuinely taken from the head of the person being operated on. The lower border of the eyelid is then thoroughly cleaned and in order for the process to be as painless as possible, rubbed with a solution of cocoa, not the hot chocolate one, the white one. The operator then, by a few skillful touches, runs his needle through the extreme edges of the eyelid, in and out, along the edge of the eye, leaving hair threads in loops of carefully graduated length. Most of the hairs have been translit, planted, take root and grow, but a few fall out. I've hated every second of that, so let's just move on. Yeah, psych guys, I'm gonna actually talk about more eye getting poked. So this is Lash Lure, a new and improved lash dye that would stop you from putting mascara on every day. Take my money. First manufactured in 1933, it was a beauty salon exclusive and bragged of it leaving you with a radiant personality. The first adverse after effect was reported literally July that year. Severe dermatitis of the eyelids surrounding the skin and edema that almost began immediately after dyeing the eyelashes with the Lashler product. Complete relief only occurred after they removed all her eyelashes. Four months later, four new cases of adverse side effects with Lashler that included vesicular eruption and marked edema, as well as carotia. Okay, never mind. Big words, you guys. Their eyes were essentially bubbling and melting. Takes a year for the first fatality. A 52-year-old woman who made the mistake of plucking her eyebrows before dying them. Within hours, her eyes swelled shut, then her fever went to 104, and after eight days of agony and eyeball ulcers and decay, she died. Not only was there a rash, yes pun intended, of side effects from Lashler in 1933, but Franklin Roosevelt became president, and Roosevelt had a major goal to better public health. And in 1933, Chicago Fair said he put up the House of Horrors, showing befores and afters of unregulated products effect on people. One was a woman before and after being blinded by Lashler. Still, it wasn't until 19 1938 that the federal FDCA passed, which finally regulated cosmetics. The first product seized under the new law was Lashler, which was alleged to have been adulterated with poisonous or delirious substances, a coal tar preparation, and a bunch of other big scary terms. Last but not least though is Radium Girls. When radium was discovered and successfully used as a cancer treatment, people made the mistake of seeing it as an all-powerful health tonic, a taken essentially like a probiotic. It became an additive in a number of everyday products, from toothpaste to cosmetics and even food and drinks. One such preparation, called Radithor, was simply distilled water with tiny amounts of the substance dissolved in it. You could just buy it in cases, you know, like go to Costco, that type of thing. Then came the tacky 1920s fads, and one was glow in the dark water. The dials were covered in a special luminous paint, shone all the time, and didn't require charging in sunlight. It looked like magic. One of the first factories to produce these watches opened a new New Jersey in 1916. It hired about 70 women, the Radium Girls, the first of thousands to be employed in many such factories in the United States. It was a well-paid, glamorous job, and since it was the most expensive substance in the world and a wonder drug, Radium Girls believed they were getting healthier as they worked, especially because they were told to lick the paintbrushes to point them. What an honor. Then came the symptoms, the toothaches, the fatigue, the nausea, the loss of taste, the infertility. Then came the first death, Molly Magia, 22, who died after years of agony and her doctor removing 
what was left of her jaw. Radium girls dropped like flies after that. For two years, their employers ferociously denied any connection between the girls' deaths and their work, even when their commission study concluded the girls had died from their pain. They did multiple more studies until one gave them the answer they wanted. So the public continued to assume radium was safe in their beauty products and in their food. In 1925, Harrison Martland's test proved conclusively radium had poisoned the watch painters by destroying their bodies from the inside. In 1927, attorney Raymond Berry agreed to accept this case, but many of the watch painters had just months to live and were forced to accept an out of court settlement. Still, their experiences made the issue of radium safety front page story across the world. So even if the United States Radium Corp denied its role and women continued to get sick and die for 11 more years, it wasn't until 1938 when a dying radium worker named Catherine DeWolf on a successfully sued Radium Dial Co. over her illness and that issue was settled. At number 10, painting veins. Back in the 17th century in Europe, many people believed that extreme paleness was just the hottest thing. If you looked whiter than a ghost, then you were like the Megan Fox of the town. Many women were obsessed with finding new ways of making themselves look pastier than a white wall and some of their methods were actually surprisingly creative. The cosmetic skills of women back then were actually pretty impressive, I must say. Wealthy aristocratic women were the ones who took part in this pale trend the most. They wore dresses with plunging necklines to show off the girls and they painted themselves white using a powder. Frankly, this powder made them look pretty artificial, like you could tell that they weren't actually naturally that white, so to solve this they came up with a new beauty trend, drawing veins. Women would draw veins on their mommy milkers using a blue color to mimic the look of translucent skin. It's crazy to think how far we've come from this, because back then people were trying to look as pale as possible and now we have people tanning themselves so much that it causes controversy. At number 9, Tiny Tea. During the Renaissance, fashion and beauty standards were changed drastically from what was popular in the years before. So much in society changed over this period of time, like what was seen as beautiful or desirable. Things like certain body types and other physical attributes had their own trends, but one of the weirdest physical beauty trends from back then had to do with teeth. Back then, the ideal woman had wide hips, a small waist, long legs, and small teeth. Yeah. Teeth had an ideal size. To people back then, the smaller the teeth, the more desirable you were. Why? I don't know, because people are weird, I guess. Some people would even go as far as to file their teeth down to make them smaller so that people would see them as more attractive. Now, I can imagine that this would be a very painful process. Like if you've ever chipped a tooth, then you know that uncomfortable, almost cold sensation of a broken tooth. So imagine that, but on all of your teeth. Yeah, you can count me out. Before we carry on talking about some of these strange things people did to be the bell of the ball, and yeah, there were some really, really weird things, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Nails for Days. These days, people get their nails done all the time. I love seeing crazy nail art videos online because they're often so creative. Some of the most fascinating ones are the crazy long nails. I don't think I could ever rock those, but I still admire those who can. The beauty trend of having long nails, though, isn't a new thing. It's been a symbol of beauty and status for many, many years, like years ago in China. Back then, having super long nails was seen as a way to show off your wealth and status. The average nail length amongst Chinese aristocrats was up to 25 centimeters or nearly 10 inches. This was all their natural nails too. And in order to protect their insanely long nails from breaking, they wore nail guards made out of gold. Not only did that protect their nails, but it was also another way of showing off their wealth because not everyone can live their lives wearing gold cages on their fingers. As you could imagine, having nails that long made it so you could barely do anything with your hands, and so that's why these aristocrats had servants, so they could perform the tasks that someone with super long nails couldn't. But would you ever want to have nails that long? <laughs> At number 7, long neck style. In many cultures around the world and for many years, having a long neck was considered beautiful, and so many women practiced neck stretching in order to attain this level of beauty. This practice of neck stretching has been most commonly done by wearing metal rings around the neck, adding more and more rings over time. This practice was first seen sometime around the 11th century in Southeast Asia. The theory behind the rings is that they're so thick that they push the head up, therefore stretching the neck, but in actuality, the lengthening of the neck is caused by the rings pushing down on the collarbones. 
The origin of this practice is pretty much unknown, but it is theorized that it began as a way to make women look more attractive in order to prevent getting captured as slaves. But on the other hand, some people believe that this was a way of protecting people from getting attacked by tigers. Two very different theories, but nonetheless valid. Though this practice began so long ago, it is still a traditional body modification in some parts of the world to this day. At number six, tiny tootsies. For many years, having the tiniest feet was seen as a popular beauty trend in China. Foot binding was a big body modification practice in China that began in the 10th century AD. It is said that this whole trend started because a court dancer bound her feet and the emperor at the time, Emperor Li Yu, really liked what he saw and soon it was encouraged for other women to do the same. Soon this practice of foot binding became a huge trend and it became associated with being able to find a husband. The practice of foot binding began when a girl was 5 or 6 years old. They would have their feet put in hot water, have their nails cut short, and have their skin rubbed with oil before having their four smallest toes broken, folded over, and tied down. Then their feet would be bent in the middle to break the arch, and the girl would have to walk around like that over time, crushing the heel and sole of the foot. After about two years, the foot would be considered ready, and depending on the size of the girl's foot by the end, this would judge how easily she'd be able to be matched with a good husband. This practice continued all the way until the 20th century, where it started to lose popularity. Number five, custom corsets. In the 19th century, the hourglass shape was considered the ideal shape of a woman's body. Of course, that's so natural looking. Love that. And the narrower the waist was, the more beautiful this lady was considered. So in an attempt to stand out from others, women would tighten their corsets impossibly tight, more and more so that their waist could literally be wrapped with two palms. Yeah, so much so their internal organs were actually compressed. Horrible, and that fast blood flow was now blocked. Corsets were made from various materials, including whalebone and steel. steel steel, that's horrible, and they're often heavily boned for support. While corsets did provide an appearance of elegance, they also have subjected women to discomfort and restricted movement, which is not great. We don't love that. We don't love standing still, not being able to breathe. Over time, concerns about health and restrictive nature of corsets, this grew, leading to the emergence of reform movements, advocating for more comfortable and less constricting undergarments. Like, please, I can't breathe. Can you please? I'm trying to go to a ball. Number four, Renaissance forehead. Four, forehead, you see what I did there. During the Renaissance era, high curved foreheads were considered a beauty ideal for both men and women alike. Now, this aesthetic preference came from the belief that a high and pronounced forehead was a sign of intelligence, wisdom, and refinement. It's not. It's really not. You look stressed out more than anything. It was associated with classical beauty and the idolized proportions found in ancient Greek and Roman sculptures. I saw a bunch of bald statues and they're like, Oh, that could be me. I could look just like that guy. Hopefully not entirely, but up top. To achieve this look, individuals would pluck or shave their hairline quite the ways back to create the appearance of a higher forehead. They would purposely give themselves a Coach Hines, all in the name of fashion, all in the name of beauty. We love that. Number three black teeth. During the Heian period in Japan from 794 to 1185, the tradition of ohagiro or teeth blackening was widely practiced and considered a symbol of beauty and maturity. Blacking out your teeth, there we go. The process involved using a solution made with iron fillings, vinegar tea, and rice wine. When applied to the teeth, it created a blackened effect. Now, while the staining was not permanent, the smell of the mixture was quite unpleasant. Now, despite this, ohagiro remained popular for centuries and was embraced by both men and women as a fashion statement and also as a cultural marker of age and status in Japanese society. Today we have, it's kind of coming back, I don't know, we have influencers with charcoal toothpaste, a little bit different but this trend, it's on its way back, I can feel it, I can feel the blackened teeth coming back into fashion. Number two, the pale look. Hi, hello, there he is. We talked about the Victorian era and the veins, that's one way to achieve a pale look. But Queen Elizabeth I, she made another method, pretty historical, pretty eye-opening. Queen Elizabeth was known to practice bloodletting as a part of her beauty routine. Bloodletting was a common medical practice during that era. It was believed to balance the body's humors and improve health. By, by dishing out blood, you can improve your health. You like that. However, Queen Elizabeth, she embraced bloodletting not solely for medical reasons, but also as a means 
means to enhance her complexion. Yeah, it was believed that by removing a small amount of blood, this would give her skin a radiant and youthful appearance. Yeah, it's nice. It really gives you that I'm about to faint look. That's great. Every painting of her is just like this, just half in, half out. This practice exemplified the extreme measures taken by individuals back then and the lengths that even royalty would go, all in their pursuit of being beautiful during the Renaissance period. No forehead, no eyebrows, no blood, apparently. What's going on? And finally, number one. Gladiator sweat. Ah uh, yes, ancient times will end here. In ancient times, the sweat of gladiators was believed to possess medicinal and even magical properties. Yeah, abracadabra, this guy's gonna take his head off. Some individuals would collect the sweat of gladiators and apply it to their skin as a beauty treatment which is pretty yucky. They believe that it could improve complexion and again, youthfulness. Just a guy's sweat rubbing on your lips. You're like, hope I get young again, fingers crossed. This practice stemmed from the belief that in transference of strength and courage through physical contact, which I don't think that's a thing. Scientifically, hasn't been confirmed. These gladiators were completely bald also. Considering the times, gladiators also practiced shaving their entire bodies, which helped reduce the risk of lice and made wounds easier to clean. Yeah, we'll end on naked, bald gladiators. Why not? And coming in at number 10, baths. From bath bombs to jacuzzis, when did people exactly start warming up that cold river water to sit in for some R&R? &R? Well, apparently the Romans were the first to think about warming her up. I don't really know if they had it in mind that warm water works better and faster to clean and rid of microparticles and had more of a oh, mentality. But one way or another, they did it. Were they really ahead of their time though? The first bathhouses have been discovered in Rome approximately being built somewhere in the second century BC. The first of its kind from a river of cold water to the abundance of over 500 steaming prominent bathhouses. You could pamper yourself head to toe for a small price, small enough so that even the poorest could bathe. That's a lot of small business owners. Hottest water in town, step right up, step right up. The Romans came up with an idea to build a spa house thing which could be flooded and heated by the floor beneath it. With a giant fireplace inside the spa, it was lit by hand and blown through the vents under the floor. Damn, they were smart, huh? Hot and steamy and good for the body. And clean, well, cleaner. The bathhouse was a technology of its own and it seemed like humanity was headed in the right direction. No, no they were not. Number nine, wiping. Do as the Romans did. It's thought that these people thought of literally everything before us. Oh yeah? How about pogo sticks, think of that? Huh? Pogoanitis? No, no you didn't. Look that up, did they? Over the years I've had some pretty jobs, but nothing as as this one. Literally. Uh, sire, would you like fronteth to backeth or backeth to fronteth today, sire? That's right, there was a job for that. People had to have had started wiping at some point, right? But who exactly and when? The groom of the stool, chief gentlewoman of the privy chamber. Call it whatever you like, we know what they did. So what exactly did they wipe with? Well, usually hay, sticks, fur, or even seashells. Every single one of those sounds itchy and terrible. I know what Charmin can do sometimes, and I can't imagine what a piece of oak could have done back then. Was there splinter taker routers as well? I can't help but feel although how painful and stinky it was, I'm sure there was at least one shared laugh, a little quality time spent with some royalty to say the least. Although this career is speculated, both King Charles I and King James I had them, so unless they decided they wanted to do that after them, someone must have continued doing it. I hope for a pretty penny at least. Those waste management dudes have pretty good benefits. Filing your taxes, looking for a job description. Uh, ah, yes, here it is, wiper. Number eight, urine. Okay, is this just gonna be disgusting the entire time? Well, the answer is yes. History's pretty disgusting. Okay, this one is weird because right when we think we figured it all out, something jarring happens, like a jar of piss and all the health benefits it had throughout history. Uh, I'm sorry, what? Well, at least they thought it did. In ancient Rome, not only was this liquid gold sold for, well, gold, it was often traded as a prominent good, sold for its multitude of healing purposes. You see, people have been using urine for thousands of years. That's right, this destructive, toxic bodily fluid could be repurposed, salvaged into many different topicals and treatments. From hair loss to your daily skincare routine, it was not only great for staining and softening leather made for shoes and clothes, it was a natural teeth whitener, an antiseptic. <laughs> That's right, from ancient Rome to as late as the 20th century, people have been tinkering and tailoring with their pee. Egyptians did it, Greeks did it. Urine is the body's natural antiseptic and was soon turning septic. Like the science behind this alone is what your buddy tells you, you know what I mean? Oh, rolled ankle? Yeah, yeah, just piss on it. Got ghosts? 
Ah, just pee on it. The ailment for all your needs. Disgusting. Number seven, teeth. Invented in 1488 by Sir Robert Tooth. Okay, I'm joking, no. Teeth were never officially invented, but what we did for them and how we cared for them had people scratching their heads for the last millennia. We've all had a toothache at some point in our lives, so they must have had them back then. In fact, oral hygiene was utterly disgusting. I didn't brush my teeth after my coffee and I can already feel it. Ew. People's teeth were so bad throughout history that dentists were actually training and teaching each other what to do about the huge toothworm problem. That's right. Imagine worms growing inside your teeth. Well, due to the swelling and pressure, people thought there were actual bugs or evil spirits living within their sore tooth, serving them extreme pain. Nope, just an infection. You need a root canal. Oh, and actual worms and bugs living in the tooth. Uh, yeah, you see this gray area right here? Uh, that's a ladybug, right? It's medieval England and things were pretty medieval. Right down to the surgery, and if you had an impacted wisdom tooth, well, that wasn't covered. England, 400 AD. People started this new trend of oral hygiene cleaning, but it wasn't spin brushes and floss. No, more like mint and vinegar and prayer. Just kind of swoosh it all around in your mouth and wipe your teeth with your shirt and call it another year. If you were lucky enough to rinse your mouth out at the time, then you could have saved yourself a visit to the medieval dentist chair. Well, actually just a slab of rock you sit up against and have a friend who's good at ripping. And there you go, buddy. Hey, wake up. The infection alone from the dirty tools going into your mouth is making me itchy. I feel like my breath stinks more now after I've read this topic. Anybody have any gum? Number six, toilet paper. Finally, something we recognize. Invented originally in China in 851 from the Tang Dynasty, these soft fabric sheets were designed for, well, you know what it was designed for, but yes, mostly the emperor's bathroom breaks and soon caught on for the commonwealth as well. The higher the class, the softer and more luxurious the material. From leather to silk, butts were seeing a kinder, gentler side of hygiene. Two ply bark versus four ply silk. The use of toilet paper throughout Europe is a messy one. Again, wipers and hay and stuff like that. It wasn't until the toilet paper rule created by Joseph Gaiety in 1857 that this hygiene method would solidify and stay for keeps. The classic under versus over is the tale as old as time. You ever want to get into a quick argument at someone's house? Just peek in the loo, see if they're rocking beard or mullet. It's the simplest way to have a know-it-all show you the patent and tell you how to wipe your own ass. Charmin'. Number five, medical shows. Today, medical shows, they're fascinating. Dr. Pimple Popper, I'll watch that all day while I eat. I don't even care, I'm disgusting like that. Dude's getting mashed potatoes squeezed out of their back, so I'm like, ah, let's go, I love it. I'm slapping that thumbs up, it's my shit. Back in the Wild West, the 1860s, the 1890s, you know, they had what's called medicinal showmen. These are, what an absolute joke, what a con. These guys would go town to town selling elixirs and tonics, everything one needs to live a happy and comfortable Western life, but they were full of lies. None of this is true. These professional medicinal showmen would have pawns run ahead and plant themselves in the audience before these random demonstrations of amazing medical elixirs, right? These shows, bunch of bullshit. They would call up random audience members, that guy that ran ahead, and then use one of these elixirs and magically treat their ailment on the spot in front of the public, right? Almost as if it was a magic show. One of the most successful of these elixirs was the elixir made from John Healy and Charles Bigelow. It was a mixture of herbs, roots, and animal fat, said to treat any and all illness. But in reality, it was just an extremely strong laxative. So yeah, if you're gonna take it, make sure you're close to home. Yuck. Number four, bad bartenders. When we think of old saloons, old West saloons with the swinging doors and stuff, a few catchphrases and a cowboy with some whiskey, all that good stuff. The bartender back then would pour a drink. The cowboy would take the bottle instead. So illegal, sir, that's theft. Please put that back. Back in the wild, wild Western days, grabbing a drink at the bar wasn't like that at all. It wasn't like anything you see in the movies. It sucked. Bartenders, they had no regulations to follow behind that dirty bar. But not only was it very high proof, but some bevy like tarantula juice was just, it would just poison you. It was literal poison. If its name didn't tip you off, it was literally made with poisonous ingredients. Cause that was, that's how cowboys did it back then. But they're hairs. I don't know. Tarantula juice was made from strychnine. If you drink it, you're gonna feel like there's tarantulas crawling all over your skin. 
That was their pitch back then. They're like, eh, happy hour, come get tarantula juice. I'm like, awesome, thank you so much. How do I not tip? Which button do I press to not give you money, you freak? Number three, grow it out. In the old west era of the United States, men often grew their hair long as a practical choice rather than a cool fashion statement. You know what I mean? All those bandits with their long hair, they had to. Living in the rugged and often isolated terrain of the west, men had to perform many physically demanding tasks like hunting, ranching, mining, pouring whiskey drinks and tarantula juice. Long hair would help protect their scalp and neck from the sun and wind and all that good stuff. But it's important to note that haircuts were not always easily accessible back then. And many men back then could not afford them or did not have access to a barber. It's like, I can't cut it. He's like, where? We don't have anything. We don't have dental. What do we do? As a result, growing their hair long became a practical and functional choice for many men back in the old west rather than, you know, style. And they were going for looks back then. They weren't doing man buns, doing the cowboy thing. They're like, no, I have bugs. I don't want you to see my bugs. I'm gonna grow it, thanks. Number two, outhouses. This one here stinks. In the wild west, outhouses were sadly common as indoor plumbing was not yet available. Didn't think of that yet. So these structures were often simple and consisted of a small building, if you wanna call it that, with a hole in the ground for your Huh, your waste disposal, if you want to call it that. Now, due to the unsanitary conditions and lack of proper waste management and knowledge and you know knowledge about germs and stuff, outhouses could attract a variety of insects and other pests, and it was just bad to go in there. Flies, mosquitoes, other bugs, they were commonly found in and around these structures, and they could potentially transmit diseases to humans. So if you're in there, you really get your business done and then get out. You don't want to waste time. You're not checking any tweets while you're in there, that's for sure. Despite the unsanitary conditions of an outhouse, they were a necessary part of daily life in the Wild West. And people learned to tolerate the bugs and just deal with it because they're like, you know what? This is better than going on outside. Whatever's going on out there, we're good. Close that up. One time I went to a cottage when I was younger and my mom didn't tell me that they had only an outhouse. No running water the entire week. I was like, awesome, let's turn around, I guess. I'm not doing that. I held it for like seven days straight. It was a nightmare. And finally, number one, broken bones. I'm lucky enough to have never broken a bone. I mean, knock on all the woods. But what if you did back in the old Western days, right? Then what would happen? But is a cowboy gonna heal you up? No. What if you were trying to learn a kickflip and you broke your leg? Then what? What are you gonna do? If the dental plan was any indication, it's... It's not pretty, not a lot of options. In the Old West, broken bones were a common occurrence, particularly among those who worked in physically demanding jobs, like ranchers, miners, cowboys, around livestock. Those things kicking you randomly, something's gonna break. Treatment options were limited and often relied on first aid techniques, you know, splinting the affected area with whatever materials were available, such as wood, cloth, or even animal hides. It sounds crazy, but back then, that was really the only method for immobilizing broken bones. Pain relief, that was only provided with natural remedies, such as oak or willow bark tea, so. You're gonna feel that entire healing process. It's gonna suck. More serious fractures, like ones that, you know, go through the skin, those require the attention of a doctor or a surgeon. However, you know, those medical professionals back then were not always available in the remote areas of the Wild West. No helicopter's gonna come in and grab you and then take you out. No, it's, you're basically fucked more often than not. Our story first begins with Shinto, which had purification rituals required before prayer, such as sweeping and washing. Sixth century, Buddhism is introduced and the casting aside of all impurities, which is part of that, can be done by bathing, washing away the seven ailments while simultaneously taking on the seven blessings. Bathing culture changed in the Edo period as Sentos brought bathhouses to commoners' daily lives. Before, they were only able to soak in the river. Baths in this period were steaming waters, with the bather often only soaking the lower part of their legs and washing water upwards. Late Edo period also brought sufuro, which is the first bath in which bathers would actually submerge to the shoulders. Men and women were also sharing the same bath and it was commonplace for bathhouses to be mixed. Something that freaked good old Commodore Matthew Perry right out when he visited Japan between 1853 and 54. Nudity doesn't always have to be primal, dude. Onsen or hot springs is a public bath in Japan that uses hot spring water to clean and relax your body, which has an endless list of health benefits from the mineral rich water. In the Showa period starting in 1926, more residential buildings with internal baths were built, and home baths became the new norm. However, still feel free to visit one of the many onsens and sentos that still exist in Japan. From the bottom to the top, let's talk hair care. Long, beautiful, shiny hair, and the Japanese believed each strand carried spiritual energy, ritualizing hair, but also how to groom it. Women in ancient Japan believed that as the comb passed through, it would gather each strand's spiritual energy. One of the most famous works from the Heian period was the Tei 
Tale of Genji. It talks about the traditional Japanese beauty and hair care. It detailed using a fine comb and how important it was to have this long straight black hair for Japanese women and even men at the time. All women seemingly had this Rapunzel goal and no art was depicted showing otherwise. Aristocratic women often achieved hair lengths that reached the floor if not past. In order to keep their hair super straight and shiny, Japanese women had one effective hair care routine. The secret? Combing. Japanese women often combed their hair right up to five times a day. And while we're on this subject, how about the power of a wooden comb? The most popular materials were the sleekish stones like jade, polished gold, but most of all, boxwood. It's naturally oily, so the combs are anti-static, avoid breakage, and are gentle on the scalp. Traditionally, boxwood combs would have been created from trees only after they've turned 35 years old. The wood is harvested in August or September when the weather is hot, but the humidity is low. Then it's dried for three years. The process from start to finish can take up to 60 steps, and the Japanese government officially recognizes close to 200 traditional national industries, and comb making tops the list to this day. Traditionally, women would be given a set of these combs when they married. They are used to create every possible hairstyle, from a slick back top knot of sumo wrestlers to the perfectly precise updo of a geisha. Even to this date, every 20 years, boxwood combs are sent to the Isi Shrine in, in Japan, where they're ritually burned in sacrifice to the sun goddess. But there's more to it than just the comb. It's all in the tsubaki sauce. In Japan, tsubaki oil was used for thousands of years as a cooking and machine oil. However, on Oshima Island, the women who harvested the oil were noticed to have long, beautiful hair and radiant, clean skin. Naturally, they'd been using the oil harvested from the tsubaki nuts on their hair and skin since it was all over their hands from working. This news flew and suddenly far and wide, Japanese women started using tsubaki for beauty purposes. Science time! Tsubaki oil contains a very high level of oleic acid, which will control the water loss while making your hair softer and more pliable and minimize shedding. Lyolytic acid in the oil stimulates hair growth, maintains healthy scalp conditions, and improves moisture retention. Tsubaki oil is non-greasy and an excellent all-around moisturizer for hair and skin. Its excellent emolinant properties keep skin and hair supple, and tsubaki also features prominently in the art of traditional pattern Japanese designs. At, dating back since the 11th century, they're called wagara, where it became popular in the motif of the Meiji period. Red, white, and black. The country's flag is one shade short from matching the most traditional makeup palette there is. The old Japanese proverb, white skin covers seven flaws, describes the obsession Japanese women had for fair skin throughout the centuries. This dates back to the Nara period in 710, when Japanese culture was heavily influenced by Chinese and Korean culture. During the Heian period, Japanese beauty aesthetics shifted away from imitation. They continued to apply the white powder to their faces, but then they started plucking eyebrows and repainting them higher, and then they blackened their teeth. By early Edo, aka the 1600s, the red, white, and black color palette was in effect. Red lip rouge and fingernail polish, white face powder, and black teeth and eyebrow pencils. Pigments were produced from fresh safflowers, became so expensive it was said to even be worth its weight in gold. During the 1800s, women began to focus more on the health of their skin rather than just the appearance. A beauty manual published in 1813 described desirable skin as being moist and naturally colored. In the late 19th century, the women's suffrage movement began to take hold across Japan. As women began to advocate for protection against oppressive patriarchal practices, the concerns for beauty began to change and workplaces and schools began to drop requirements for makeup. And finally, from the 1980s, beauty started to move away from emulating the West. More Japanese women were able to represent their own Japanese identity internationally. Models like Yamaguchi Sayoaka, who made it onto the international scene, served as inspiration for young Japanese women to embrace their own beauty. But I know I can't breeze by something I'd mentioned, so. It's number five, a whole lot of man. Well, folks, I haven't done much traveling in my time, but it looks like I know where I'm headed next to the body tribes of Ethiopia. Where, ladies and gentlemen, it's men of my proportions that are most attractive. <laughs> the men of the Bodhi tribe participate in beauty pageants of sorts, where the winner is declared a hero, and every girl in the village wants to be with the rotund hero. The men isolate themselves away for months at a time with no physical activity. Honestly, for a World of Warcraft player, isn't that hard? Where the men consume a diet that's high in fat to, well, make them fat. What's on the menu? I'm so glad you asked. Well, since the Bodhi tribe has such a great grasp on agriculture, the men drink cow's milk mixed with blood. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about that one. After enough consuming of the milkshake from hell, the men's stomachs get fat and the gawking commences. I'm more than just a cut of meat, ladies. 
You can't just treat me that way. Number four, Shark Girls. All right, when I was researching this one, I could barely even look at the footage. I was literally cringing in my chair. And this is coming from a guy who likes the Star Wars prequels. Yeah, I know. There's certain women of tribes around the world who have teeth like jaws that are considered beautiful. And I mean the shark, not the James Bond villain. The process of sharpening teeth is quite... Uh, well, interesting to say the least, as it's performed by dentists, and I would hardly call them dentists, as they use rocks and chisels to acquire this acquired look. Did I mention there's no anesthesia for this cosmetic surgery? All jokes aside, this is just a lot, and I actually get lightheaded just thinking about it. We gotta move on to the next point before I lose my lunch, or I pass out. Uh. Number three, the George Costanza. Today, every girl wants those long, luscious locks. No split ends with healthy hair and just a radiant glow. But women in ye olde Europe were after the chrome dome kind of look, if you know what I'm saying. They had their hair pulled back, revealing a large portion of their forehead. Hey, look ladies, not that there's anything wrong with balding. It happens. I'd be very ignorant to say that it might happen to me too. It could, when I get old, it'll probably happen. I actually know a guy who's balding right now. Shout out to him. It's just strange how something that could be considered not beautiful today was all the rage back then. Queens literally sat down on their chairs and said, Give me the George Costanza look, please. I'm feeling like a real winner today, Jerry. Number two, burn it off. In ye olde times, medicine wasn't great. That's no secret. And sometimes these trendy medical practices crossed over into beauty. What do I mean by that? Well, nobody's perfect, right? We've all got bumps, bruises, blemishes, zits, pimples, scars, moles, spots, freckles, skin tags, eye bags, boils, bunions, warts, dark spots, and some emotional damage that a therapist or a bottle of vodka could not fix. However, when people in the olde times needed to remove any of the list I just mentioned, besides the internal suffering that is chronic depression and anxiety, they use hot pokers. No, that's not medicine, but rather the same kind of hot poker that you put in a fire. They were used to burn whatever it was that, well, needed to be burned off. Yes, burned off. While still a medical practice, imagine how beautiful you would feel after your least favorite spot got burned off in excruciating pain and probably causing an infection. Are you ready? Here it comes. I'm gonna do it twice in this list, but I'll let you guys finish it. Are you ready? I spoke to the chief and he said, it's not it. There you go. Hey, you said it. Let's go. Number one, glowing teeth. Teeth are important, and this is a reminder that you should go to the dentist, stop putting it off, seriously. Healthy mouth is gorgeous for everyone. So that's why you'd want to use Doramand, a radioactive toothpaste. A what? Yes, a radioactive toothpaste, coming full circle with the radiation today. This stuff was what it said on the box. And this one literally did say it on the box, it was radioactive toothpaste. Like that was something to brag about or something. I don't need to tell you why that's wrong, or unhealthy. You may as well just sit in a room and leave an x-ray machine on all day at that rate. Only minty fresh toothpaste for me, please. Number 10, no lice. You know in elementary school when they would check everyone for lice and one poor sucker had to get their head shaved and walk around as that bald kid for like a month and would probably get bullied? Well that ain't gonna happen back in ancient Egypt because everyone shaved their heads to avoid lice back then and priests would shave their whole bodies just like Michael Phelps. Instead of having actual hair of their own, they would wear wigs. Wigs sometimes made of human hair. That honestly was a lot better in that harsh desert sun. Lice and other little pests like that, like fleas, were not wanted. And yeah, they still aren't. But it led to some honestly interesting solutions. For example, a warm potion of date meal and water was believed to drive away fleas and lice. They would use cat's fat to keep away mice, I made a rhyme, and one that probably actually did something was when they used a solution of natron water and salt in their humble abodes to eliminate and repel fleas. Number nine, ancient sunscreen. As soon as summer comes around, game over. I burn so easily. That's why I'm a fan of winter. I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day, all night, and feel like I'm about to faint, obviously. Canada gets quite hot. But how did Egyptians beat the heat in ancient times? What was their trick? They didn't have banana breeze, FPF, SPF 90, whatever the hell it is. Ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty, right? You think your morning skincare routine requires a lot of work? Think again, Laura. Their routine was written on tomb walls and scrolls. Rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma orizinol was used to block the sun off. Yeah, it was that hard. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. And ancient Greeks as well, they used olive oil as sunscreen as well as ancient Egyptians. Which as far as UV protection goes, it did absolutely nothing. You'd be burnt and extremely dehydrated, but also you'd have some nice tan lines and you wouldn't be as pale as me, so 
it wasn't all bad. Number eight, the finest of cosmetics. The cosmetics of ancient Egypt were not just for looking good, they were for feeling good too. Like on the inside. Now, as such, those professionals who made the stuff took it pretty seriously. Not just because of a passion for the art, but also because they'd be judged pretty damn harshly if they did a bad job. If they sucked, it would mean having the whole neighborhood give you a bad reputation. And in the cosmetics business, just like show business, it's all about that reputation. It would also mean some harsh judgment from the big boys upstairs, meaning the gods when you met the afterlife. So yeah, they wanted to do a good job. And to meet that end, they would try and use the finest of ingredients, as they should when people have to put this stuff on their skins and right next to their eyes and stuff. Number seven, deodorant. Before the Old Spice guy was born, what did people even do to smell good? What, I don't, what happened? Deodorant was actually first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s. It was called Mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide. It was stored in a metal container, nothing like speed stick at all. It wasn't discreet or anything. It was bad, but ancient Egyptians Eh, even worse. They had to use ostrich eggs when it came to smelling good in the pits. They made perfumes as well and were among the first to use any type of deodorant. So that's that's a pretty good start. Thank you. Thank you so much, ancient Egyptians. Hence the ostrich egg factor. They had to start somewhere. They mixed a little fat, tamarisk, tortoise shell, and then nuts, and bam, there you go. You're ready for the day. Just pop it on. Another method was a little more yummy than the ostrich eggs and nuts method. Egyptians would use porridge balls. Yeah, flavored porridge rolled up and securely tucked under your arms. Honestly, that seems like a better alternative. Sometimes when you put antiperspirants like deodorant on, it gets like all, it all crumbles apart. It's like feta cheese all of a sudden. You're like, what happened to this stick? I want, I would rather have porridge balls than just call it a day, boom. Number six, get this man a Tic Tac or something. Just like I use mints to cure my nasty tea breath, which I argue is worse than coffee breath, the ancient Egyptians used breath mints to keep things fresh. Honestly, they actually sound kind of good. Frankincense, cinnamon, melon, pine seeds and cashews put together, ground up and bound together in candy using honey. <laughs> Just heat that bad boy over the fire and let it cool and boom, breath mints. I like it. I like it a lot. These breath mints would be made commercially by those fine cosmeticians and dentists. Or they could even be made at home. Some archaeological finds of bowls, jars, and other dishes suggest that they may have been candy dishes that would hold the lovely taste in little suckers. Always gotta keep things fun, fresh, and flirty back in ancient Egypt. And breath mints would certainly help you do the trick. <laughs> nice. Item number five, long skulls. One of the most bizarre beauty trends from ancient times, at least, was the process of head shaping. This unusual beauty trend caused people in modern times to think that aliens were real when remains were discovered with oddly shaped skulls. Some people believe that we had proven the existence of extraterrestrials, but in reality, it led to the discovery of an entire practice of human body modification for the purpose of beauty. The process of head shaping involves putting some kind of pressure on a baby's head so that it grows into a different shape. This was known to be done by using cloth or even boards to create the desired shape. This is one of the oldest beauty trends in history as the earliest evidence of modified skulls come from Australia and date back between 14,000 and 9,000 years ago. The skulls that were found had flattened foreheads and very prominent brow ridges. This practice also occurred quite often in South America where skulls with a variety of different shapes have also been found. I'm kind of glad that we don't do this anymore because I could not imagine going through life with a cone head. I wonder how it would feel to have a head shaped like that. My neck hurts just thinking about it. Item number four, five head. Let's go back to the Renaissance for a bit to talk about yet another one of their super strange beauty trends. They really had a lot of weird desires when it came to appearances and I'm certainly glad that this next one is no longer in style and I really hope it never makes a comeback. Back in the Renaissance, it was believed that girls with high curved foreheads were the most beautiful, but obviously not everyone can be built like that. As people do, they came up with a way of achieving this look without having to be born with said attributes. In order to have that big forehead that people so desired, women were known to have shaved or plucked the hairs from their natural hairline to make their foreheads look bigger and therefore more desirable. They really said, receding hairline, but make it fashion. Suppose. At number three, feet painting. Now you would think that all of the super bizarre beauty trends of the past were from way back in the day, but you would be mistaken. We saw some strange practices in the 20th century as well, especially during war times. Back in World War II, a shortage of silk and nylon in America created a bizarre beauty trend. Because these materials were needed to make things like parachutes and uniforms for troops, tights were quickly disappearing from stores. 
because this was such a huge staple in women's fashion, they got creative and created a beauty trend where women would draw pantyhose arrows in their legs, dye them with different colors, and try and mimic the look of mesh tights to create an illusion close to wearing stockings. I feel like if this happened in today's time, I don't think I would be that desperate to do that. And you couldn't catch me drawing or dyeing my legs for this. I think I'll just stick to wearing pants. Item number two, strange corsets. Corsets have been around for a long time. They've come in and out of style, and even right now, corsets seem to be making their way back into mainstream fashion, though maybe not as extreme as back in the day. In the 19th century, having an hourglass figure was seen as the ideal body type, and so in order for many women to achieve this look, they wore corsets to cinch their waists. However, the looks were pretty extreme. Some women tightened their corsets so tight that their waist could be wrapped with two hands. Like, imagine that. Although this was seen as super chic back in the day, it was also causing some health issues because it would squish together people's organs, and as you can imagine, that's not a good thing. Eventually, corsets evolved so that rather than cinch the waist so much, it would just accentuate the hips to still give an hourglass shape without causing too much bodily harm. And finally, at number one, no-no piercings. How many of you guys out there have piercings? I have a few myself, but I have my ears pierced, and obviously my nose is pierced. But there are so many other places that you can get pierced, even in the no-no region. Back in the Victorian era, piercings down under were pretty popular and were considered to be very fashionable amongst wealthy women. Some women would have their nippies pierced and even chained together, and some men would even get their peepees some jewelry too. For women, it was all about trends, but for men back then, many of them got their nether regions pierced supposedly to make wearing tight pants more comfortable. This piercing was called the Prince Albert, and it was given that name based on the legend that Prince Albert got his little prince pierced in order to hide the size of his junk underneath his clothes. Whether or not that's actually true is beyond me, but I would imagine that getting that piercing would be painful. Absolutely painful. But remember, in the wise words of Beyonce, pretty hurts. Oh boy, was she right. Number 10, golden hair. Hair is important. Imagine how different George Clooney would look if he was balding. Ooh. You gotta take care of your hair. There's nothing like treating your scalp to a nice scented and moisturizing shampoo. The Incas thought this too. And reach for the next best thing, fermented pee. Oh yes, that's right. Basically, you take a pot, you put some wee in it, and let it sit for a week. Why not? Want to stay smelling fresh, of course. I'm not sure if this would make your hair silky smooth, as I'm not frankly in the market to try this. And this one, I can firmly say that if you try this one at home, stop it. Get some help. Don't do that. We belong in to the toilet, not on top of your head. Stop. Number nine, what a crock. As if urine in the hair wasn't enough, this beauty trend comes at you from the Romans and the Greeks. The Romans and the Greeks were the peak of ancient civilizations built beautiful monuments, and were honestly just so smart, so smart. So smart that when they saw crocodile dung, they knew right away it had some beauty properties that they just couldn't pass up. They would bathe in crocodile dung. That's right, bathe in crocodile dung. Known for its restorative and anti-aging properties, I'm just not sure how this works really. Did they like heat it up or something, or did this like slip into a tub? with a pile of like lukewarm unlawfulness. And how do they really know it had de-aging properties? I'm starting to think this knowledge might be related to the whole urine shampoo thing. This is also gonna be a hard pass for me. No thanks, I'm, I'm good. No, no, no poo in the hair. Number eight, beauty is pain. Ladies, we all know sometimes beauty is pain. It can be a lot or even too much sometimes, but how far are you willing to go for a little extra beauty. In ye olde times, pale skin was considered to be beautiful, but not always the easiest to obtain. Makeup is expensive and was made of lead and other lovely materials. With all that makeup being caked on, that had to feel lovely on your face. So what's the next best thing? Bloodletting, yes, that's right. In order to have that healthy twilight pale look, women found themselves relieving themselves of their blood. Bloodletting was used for other medical reasons at the time as well, but why not get two birds stoned at once? Stay healthy and achieve that beautiful complexion. I unfortunately pass out at the sight of someone else's blood, so the loss of my own just to be pale would not, would not bode well for me. I will have to hard pass on this trend as well. 
Plus, look at these rosy cheeks. I don't want to lose that. I think it makes me look cute. Number seven, mice flavored toothpaste. It's ancient Egypt. Life is great. You got the pyramids. You got the Nile River. And you got some guy who claims to be a doctor and he's pulling out the brains of your last king through his nose so he can be mummified for the afterlife. That's just awesome. Just another day under Ra's warm sand. Egyptians just knew how to live and they knew dental hygiene was important. So they came up with toothpaste. Sore tooth? Try this toothpaste. What was this toothpaste made of, you ask? Well, it was made of crushed mice, of course. Oh, God. I mean, here I am thinking that just some herbs crushed up with some water would be fine to eliminate bad breath, but after all, having nice teeth and nice breath is sexy. So the Egyptians took some mice and they crushed them up with other ingredients in what must have been the most foul and rancid concoction this side of the Nile River. Just go ahead, put that goop in your mouth. You'll look okay, you'll look great after. Oh, just brush it on there, smells great. Oh, that's amazing. Number six, pearly blacks. Here's another beauty trend brought to you by the horrifying things we as human beings can do to a mouth. In Japan, there's a practice called ohaguro, which just translates to blackening of teeth. Japanese women would essentially, over time, dye their teeth black. Another dual purpose, as it was thought to preserve teeth in old age, and was seen as a sign of beauty. Something that separates humans from beasts, or so they thought. The dye itself was similar to some inks, as the process involved dissolving iron, vinegar, and some oils. After this process, a concoction is made that is a non-water soluble and acts like a dye when applied to the teeth. Yet again, as a semi-charming internet host, I am going to pass on this opportunity. Plus, who am I to judge? Japan has given us lots of fun stuff, lots of great stuff. They're awesome. Mario, Zelda, Little Mac? Basically, I'm a Nintendo nerd, so I can never speak ill of the land of my favorite games. Even if the whole black teeth thing only ended like 150 years ago, which, when you think about it, isn't that long ago. Number five, the great stink. Um, the what, what? Oh, no, 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 yeah, I read that right. The Great Stink of 1858 was an event in central London in the summer, during which the hot weather exaggerated and amplified the smell of untreated human waste and gunk that had washed up on both in and on the banks of the River Thames. The problem had been growing for years with an out-of-date technology and overflowing sewage system that emptied directly into the river. The stank was thought to have been the root cause of a number of contagious diseases and three outbreaks of cholera before it was agreed upon that a small problem was emerging. You think? Long story short, all the garbage, human waste, bloated bodies were all just washing up around the same time. Hey, I caught one. No, oh, that's an arm. Okay. And just cooking in all that sun all day? I know what August feels like, and I've smelt my garage and garbage day, and I can't imagine the smell already in central London at that time. And for people to have complained so much that it was even stinkier, that's absolutely rotten. Number four, nose gaze. I was just thinking, where are all these inventions and blueprints on how to stop the smell? If you can knit metal into a crop top, you can cover your mouth and nose, can't you? Well, close enough. Nose gaze were invented. Basically just big nose plugs one would wear day to day to drown out the smell of absolute filth. Just plug it up and ignore it was their mentality. A makeshift wad of bunched up herbs and flowers shoved up your nose, blocking the nasal cavity from the stank that followed. Just see number five. A poo-pourri for each nostril. Would this make things worse, ignoring the smell? Wouldn't that make it even harder to find out where it's coming from? Nope, just band-aid it. It's gonna disappear on its own. We're humans, we're designed to smell stuff for our own survival. The smell is like what lets us know not to go down there. Oh, no, no. Like wouldn't everything just smell like roses at that point? These people were trying to avoid the stinky streets because that actually meant that's where the infection and disease was actually hanging out. The blind leading the blind. Number three, flushing. Okay, we're making some ground here. We got toilet paper, we got something for the smell. So now where do we put it? Well, plumbing and flushing wasn't connected to each house like it is today. See, the Greeks and Romans had it down to a science. They built drainage systems and learned from the ancient Mesopotamian people how to exactly deal with the problem of waste. A system of pipes, tubes, and drains. The bathroom problem seemed like an easy solution. Use gravity downhill to dispose of the waste outside the city. And here's the kicker. It can even be reused and repurposed at the end as an irrigation system, further nurturing the farming of crops. No, that's good, no, he's right. And then it disappears and literally goes downhill again. After the Roman Empire had fallen, this European dark sanitation era had begun and hygiene sorta of just 
slipped away. People weren't really concerned with things like disease and plague and instead leaned into real science like witchcraft or burning cats for fun. You know, important stuff. It wasn't until about the mid 1850s where people revisited this age old problem and recreated and did exactly the same thing science we already knew. Things were unnecessarily stinky for way too long. It wasn't until the British colonies started tinkering in Boston around the 1700s that proper piping and toiletry transport was eventually built and catalogued. Thus was born the first sanitation system again. And we still see it today, thank God. Number two, disinfectants. How did people exactly know if something was clean or not? They couldn't have just seen the particles back then. Let's hear a chamber pot. It smells clean. People were plugging their noses so they couldn't even smell anything. They couldn't smell if it was clean or not. There certainly wasn't a demand for a fresh lemon scent that we're all used to. This was the birth of some basic antiseptic. Chemists were mixing and mashing chemicals and a new form of cleaning agent was introduced in the 1890s by German chemist science Gustav Rappenstrauch in hopes to rid the country of the overflowing cholera epidemic and seize the spread of germs and the disease. By mixing benzalkonium and hydrogen peroxide, you were left with a chemical compound that would destroy and clean infections on medical patients. Light bulb. Thus leaning towards the direction of an all-purpose surface cleaner, killing bacteria and ridding the area of harmful toxins. And drum roll please, Lysol was created. That's right, the same Lysol we use today. This was a push in the right way for humanity. An easy to use liquid cleaner that would aid disinfecting everything in its way. I've seen the bottle and the Wemyss labels. Must have been even stronger back then too. Hope no one spilled it on themselves in testing. Ooh, ouch, that is a class one chemical burn. <laughs> You're just gonna wanna pee on that for 12 to 13 days. And number one, soap. Finally, the end of all our ailments. Soap, the answer. Well, not really. See, it's been around since the Romans because they literally did everything before us and stop bragging, we get it. Made out of animal fats, ash, and mostly lye, these makeshift balls of soap were invented years ago. And then forgotten, and then invented again, and then forgotten again. Cleanliness was loose, remember, and it was almost uncool to believe in science, and it wasn't really until the mass production of this chemical detergent that it really stuck. Soap was predominantly sold produced and commercialized in the late 1800s. By this time, scientists were fiddling around with things like Lysol and more chemical compounds, sparking its way to the study of germs. A vital step towards large-scale soap production, and it actually started in 1791, when a French chemist, Nicolas Leblanc, patented a system for making soda ash from salt, at which point added with animal fat, and there you have it. The slippery bar we're all used to today. The discovery made soap making one of America's fastest growing industries in 1850. And it seemed from then on in it was only up. It's crazy to think that someone at this time, even after soap was invented, were still spit shining surgical instruments to be clean. <laughs> That's good. 